everyone. Good morning, London and Europe. Good afternoon, Brisbane and Australia. And welcome to the UQ, UK government's Science and Innovation Network Digital Society Network virtual event. My name is Professor Heather Zwicker, and I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Science, Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. And I'll be the MC for today's virtual event. Even though we're all Zooming from different locations, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands where UQ stands. We pay respects to elders past and present who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within our community and their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Thank you, perfect. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our guests. Her Excellency, Mrs. Vicky Treadle, British High Commissioner to Australia, Mr. David McCready, OBE, the CEO of the Australian British Chamber of Commerce, who's adjudicating our great debate, Ms. Joanne Holland, Executive Director of the Australia United Kingdom Chamber of Commerce, our keynote speaker and panelists, representatives from government and industry, colleagues, one and all. We are thrilled to have you joining us. Today's event will explore the theme, how digitization has impacted society. As part of the UK Australia season 2021-22, a major new cultural exchange that explores and celebrates the relationship between Australia and the UK across the arts, creative industries, and higher education. There will be two parts to this exciting event. Part A, which is this current session, will center on interactive breakout se sessions on digital health and society and digital world and disruptive technology. Part B will include a keynote address by Professor Steve Benford, Professor of Computing Science at the University of Nottingham, as well as the great debate where leading experts from around the world will argue whether digitization is reshaping humanity for the better. Part B will be brought to us via YouTube and we'll provide, we will provide instructions when it's time to head over there. I now have the pleasure of introducing a pre-recorded poem by the formidable poet, performer, intellectual, and cultural performer ancestress to acknowledge the Aboriginal people and lands from which we are meeting today. I want to acknowledge the Jagarai, Yagara, Yugraful and Turrbal peoples who gathered here and lived with these lands for thousands and thousands of years. Scientists, conservationists, sustainable farmers, ecologists, they had their own education systems for their own sacred knowledges. A part of a continent governed in a way that didn't require war, sacred beings in autonomy, strong in their law. No need for a greed-based economy or a needs-based monopoly that continues to steal. The sophistication of these peoples from these places is unmatched to this day in this place despite having to deal with the trauma of the efforts of the colony to have the truth concealed, they continue to heal. And we acknowledge them in their continuing sovereignty. They have belonged and will belong. Their connections to their countries will out outlast us all, just as it has the policies of the past, just as it does the concrete and glass. I also want to acknowledge that the land itself is sovereign to us all, Creator spirits still cause, still call, rise and fall. We are still in creation. Scientific explanations include the very foundations that we have respected for ages. Mundagara, the rainbow serpent for me, rest in deep waterholes. Yes, water is sacred. 
My sacred tree, the small Briglow, grows on the banks of what we now call the Dawson, teaching me my roots run deep. My grannies and grandbabies' country will always be home. No matter how much colonizers disrupt, turn over, infect and corrupt, me and my country got strong love. They can't muck that up. Connection inseparable, spiritual bonds. Even if they try to turn my river into dried up dams and ponds, I know we will come back and flow on. They stole our tongues and kept us from our songs, but the message still lives and has to carry on. As it is country who sings us, ancestors through time, back and forwards, forever long. Big corporations dig up coal and send it off to harm the sacred essence of existence. Me and my country still stay persistent, even if there's parts of both of us missing. Indigenous peoples have belonging that can never be truly dispossessed. We have the power to find sanctity in our own divine breath. No Aboriginal people have ever ceded sovereignty in this continent. We know that even breathing is a reciprocal relationship with the natural world we live in. We have a sense of knowing that comes from country, different to mythology, superstition or religion. Our belonging with this place is not something that can be owned by a colonial governance system. We know that their shadow knowledge causes destruction that cannot be forgiven. We know that this farce is upheld by violence and division and our true ownership cannot be sold, stolen or given. We know they displace our bodies, sometimes even spirits and minds through ongoing genocide, race-based hate, ongoing war crimes and through the living out of their entire ontological design. We know that they do the same to country with false ownership and ecocide through their farms, poisons, pollution and mines. But we know we are still here and we will not be confined. We know that Jagara, Yagara, Yugrapul and Turrbal tribes deserve respect for their sovereignty, their ancestors' lives, as well as for their current part of the sacred continuum of culture through time, while they continue to heal, to remember and to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Tira. Uh, I would like to mention that on the landing page under event resources, we have several videos and links that are associated with the event. And one of these is a link to a one by one clip, which was created by Tila Watson and was recently screened at Imaginative, which is a, uh, a massive uh, First Nations arts and culture show based in Toronto. It's a very powerful clip and I encourage you uh, to watch it. You can also follow her at Ancestress on Twitter if you're inclined to so do. It is now my pleasure to invite Professor Deborah Terry AO, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland to give the welcome address. Welcome Professor Terry. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, and I'm uh, delighted uh, to be here uh, this afternoon, uh, Australian times time. And I would just like to thank Tila uh, Watson uh, for that very, very moving uh, acknowledgement. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting here today in Australia. We honour their elders and their continuing cultural and spiritual connection to this land as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. I'd also like to acknowledge Her Excellency Mrs Vicky Treadle, British High Commissioner to Australia, Mr David McGreedy, OBE, CEO of the Australian British Chamber of Commerce, Ms uh, Joanne Holl Holland, Executive Director of the Australia UK Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to acknowledge the many leaders from across industry, government and academia who are contributing their expertise to our program here today. And finally, welcome to everyone in Australia, the UK and around the world who has joined us online to participate 
in this digital society event. We have, as we've heard from Heather, a rich program planned for you that really explores how our lives, our relationships and our culture are being transformed by the influence of all pervasive digital technology. A program like this is only possible when you have the support and the commitment of like-minded partners. And for this event, we've had immense support from a range of organisations that are committed to strengthening the commercial, academic and cultural ties that bind Australia and Britain. And I'd like to convey our thanks to the British High Commission in Canberra and the UK Government Science and Innovation Network who are sponsoring this event as part of the annual UK Australia Seasons Showcase. And I'd also like to acknowledge again our corporate partners, the Australia UK Chamber of Commerce based in London and the Australian British Chamber of Commerce based in Sydney. Both of these chambers have helped us to shape this thought-provoking event in which we'll be exploring how digitisation has impacted society through a combination of discussion, debate and cultural experiences. Naturally, because of the partners involved in the design of today's program, we're also going to be viewing this theme through the lens of the long-standing historical and cultural ties that bind Australia and Britain. In that regard, our university, the University of Queensland, really exemplifies the close links that exist between our two nations. Indeed, if we go back into the history books, the four founding professors who taught the very first classes here at UQ in 1911 were all British born and educated. Today, 111 years later, I'm proud to say that UQ still maintains particularly close ties with our academic colleagues right across the UK. In fact, UQ has more partnerships with UQ-based universities than we do with any other country in the world. And we're especially proud to be collaborating with many of the UK's leading academic institutions, including the University of Exeter, King's College London, Edinburgh University, Nottingham University, Oxford University, Imperial College London and the University College of London. In total, UQ has 29 institutional agreements with the UK, including some 20 agreements that support student exchange and mobility between our nations. In the past five years, our researchers have also collaborated with British colleagues on more than 200 research projects and co-published more than 5,000 articles. We're very committed to broadening this collaboration because this kind of global engagement helps us to extend the impact of our teaching, of our research and of our community programs. So it creates new opportunities for UQ to have an impact on a global stage. Importantly, we've also maintained global collaboration through the pandemic even as border closures have made it impossible to meet in person. And undoubtedly, digital platforms such as this have been absolutely vital in helping us to navigate and manage through the disruption of the past two years. So it's very apt that our two nations, located at opposite ends of the globe, are coming together online today to consider how the digital world is reshaping so many aspects of our lives. The influence and the impact of digital technology is a topic that occupies academics working across every discipline that we teach and we research at UQ. Just recently, we launched the new Digital Cultures and Societies Hub, located in our Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, the purpose of that Hub is obviously to mobilise our leading researchers from across disciplines to collaborate in supporting students to consider the ways that digital technologies are changing our world. We also host a digital data and society network and a burgeoning digital health research network. And in partnership with the University of Exeter, the Quex Institute also has a dedicated thematic focus 
on research into the impacts of the digital world and disruptive technology. So many of the topics that we'll be exploring throughout this Digital Society events event are topics that the academics here at UQ are grappling with every day. So I'll conclude now by just saying thank you to our many friends and colleagues in the UK for your ongoing support. Thanks especially to those of you based in the UK who have chosen to set the alarm in order to join us today. Thank you for choosing to start your day with us here in Australia. And I've no doubt that you'll be rewarded, as will we, by the quality of the discussions, the debate and the cultural experiences that are ahead of us today. So it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Her Excellency Mrs Vicky Treadill, the British High Commissioner to Australia, to give her welcome address. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you very much indeed, Debbie. It's uh, wonderful to be able to join you all here in Australia and back home in the United Kingdom. May I also begin by acknowledging the land from which I address all of you, uh, Nunawal country, to their elders past, present and future. And may I acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be online joining us for the exciting event that lies ahead. And if I may briefly pause and also acknowledge the very powerful uh, welcome to country that Tiller gave us, it contained important challenge, particularly for us as the country that was the colonizer and the consequences of that transformation that happened as a result of Britain's arrival to Australia. There is history that we must acknowledge, but also the lessons from history that we must learn in order to take forward. As you say, Debbie, to build that shared pathway into the future. And a moment too to pause that whatever our history and our past, all that is good and was great and all that we may yet have to reconcile. It is about who we are now, the theme of the UK Australia season. As we reassess and better understand each other as people, as countries, our place in the world currently, both our countries have transformed over the last century and a half. We are different, we are more multicultural. Uh, here in Australia, the embrace of this 60 millennia old uh, heritage and culture that is so much part of what defines Australia today. To the more recent migrant communities, the rich diaspora that you have across Australia. And for us too in Britain, the transformation in our people, who we are, where our ancestors came from. It is ridiculous to regard both our countries today as part of the Anglosphere, when actually for Australia, you had a history long before the Anglosphere. And for us today in Britain and in Australia, with the rich diversity in our societies, we are multicultural, we are modern, and we look to the future. And embracing each other for who we are is vitally important. And in the last two years with COVID, how did we keep connected? How did we maintain those relationships that we have across society, between our people, between academia, government to government, and the work that we do each day towards building our relationship. And of course, it was digital platforms that enabled us to speak to family and friends, to share what we were feeling, what we were thinking. It was digital platforms that allowed us to negotiate our groundbreaking world first bottom up FTA free trade agreement with Australia. And the digital world is here to, to sustain. It has reframed the way we operate. It influences and informs and shapes us as people. There is huge good in that, 
but there is also a dark side that we need to be mindful of. How we protect our children, for example, from online harms. These are amongst the global challenges we face together with our complex historical connection to one another. But as we look to the future, it is about building a modern partnership, a modern partnership of understanding. For us and my team, that includes a first ever for Britain in Australia, our indigenous engagement strategy in negotiating the free trade agreement, making sure those references for a whole of society, for a whole of community opportunity across our businesses whether indigenous owned or foreign owned, um, it was about everyone who employs, everyone who creates, everyone who makes and has something to sell to each other's country. It is about what we invest in each other. It is about that relationship building and actually how together we can work to make our nations thrive. Only last week, our two prime ministers had a virtual summit. They discussed a range of issues, how we should collaborate, uh, indeed, in science and in technology. Today is the first anniversary of the launch of our space bridge. Here in my house in Canberra, I hosted an event where we signed the MOU between our two space agencies um, that has formed the space bridge. And our science partnership series was announced last week by our two prime ministers. But indeed, as we think of science and as we think of space, I'm minded that the indigenous people had an understanding of space in a wholly different way from the magnificent artwork behind me that represents the Seven Sisters, a story of space, an eternal story. And I remember once being told modern astrology studies each individual star, but the indigenous people look at the space between the stars. What does that tell us? If we combine the two understandings, we have a much richer understanding of our universe and what makes it tick. So in our modern science partnership, we shouldn't forget the traditional, and what tradition can teach us in terms of science. And understanding those differences and the space between the differences enables us to build new bridges going forward. But coming to the practical and how we collaborate together, my government in Britain is very focused on research and development. It is only through this that the new innovations and technologies of the future will come through. The current technologies can evolve, be adapted and modernize and further improve. To invest in science and research is an endeavor every country has to enter. And the global competition we face, doing it together is all the more important. How do we reach solutions? We are Northern Hemisphere in Britain. You are Southern Hemisphere. Our seasons and our days are the opposites of each other. Imagine how rich that opportunity is. Two springs, two summers, two winters, two nights, two days. In every working day, every week, every year. That means if we're imaginative about how we use time, we can have a 24-hour day between Britain and Australia as well as a 24-hour night to study the skies. How exciting is that proposition? We have to rethink the art of the possible, what Britain and Australia can do together because of our difference at the opposite ends of the world. But in that difference, a huge connection to do great things together in a way we have never conceived or imagined possible before. On our part, our government is investing up to £22 billion a year by 2025. That's how serious we are about this endeavour. But in that research and development work we do that we will spend that money on, we will be looking at how we can partner and collaborate 
with Australian institutions. We want to put ourselves on track to increase total research and development investment by up to 2.4% of our GDP by 2027. But as I said, this cannot be done in isolation. Enhanced Australia-UK collaboration will be spurred by our free trade agreement, the new innovation and mobility chapters that we locked into our FTA, because we want to see the best of our talent flowing between our two countries, the best of our talent working together to create the new science, the new solutions, the new technologies. Great new initiatives like our AUKUS partnership with the United States and the Turing scheme for academic mobility. All of that opens new possibilities. It deepens and broadens our partnership. We will see increased research partnerships and most importantly, the commercialization of the new technology that our science delivers. Whether for digital technologies, cyber, AI, machine learning, and quantum applications. This, is, this kind of collaboration is epitomized. For example, the Quex uh, Institute for Global Sustainability and Wellbeing, that partnership, a UQ and Exeter joint virtual research center. How exciting is that? Quex funds and facilitates joint PhDs International, providing international collaboration grants, symposia, and staff exchanges to explore major societal challenges, digital worlds, disruptive technologies, healthy living, and global environmental futures. UQ has 29 institutional agreements with 19 UK universities, including, as I've mentioned, Exeter, but Oxford, UCL, Cambridge, Edinburgh, LSE, Nottingham, and KCL. That's UK wide. It is across every part of Britain engaging here in Australia. And this is replicated through other universities and partnerships and collaboration that we have. And we want to encourage more of that. UQ now enjoys 130 UK born academic staff remember I mentioned attracting the best talent to each other's country and 175 academic staff with UK qualifications. We're proud to be part of their story. We're proud to be part of today's event and to support it uh, with the Australian British Chamber of Commerce. And may I acknowledge David McCready too, their CEO with us here and also the Australia United Kingdom Chamber of Commerce. I think that speaks too to the very partnerships and alliances I talk about. And if I may briefly end, when I took over this job, the task was to take the UK-Australia relationship to a new level of strategic partnership. But more than that, to breathe new life into this unique relationship that we have between our two countries. And I said at the very beginning, to acknowledge our history, that was painful too, as well as that was joyous and proud and great. We have work to do moving forward, but I think we have an excellent platform on which to build because we better understand today who we are now. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency and Professor Terry for your opening remarks. I think when, if we imagine that as a foundation for moving forward in the rest, for the rest of today's event, we have a good touchstone in your phrase of combining understandings. All right, well, we might get started. So look, welcome everyone to clearly the better of the breakout rooms. Um, my name is Associate Professor Claire Sullivan, and I am the head of the Digital Health Research Network at the University of Queensland. I'm also a very pre endocrinologist at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital uh, and the Clinical Informatics Director for Research at Metro North. 
And I also position as a research fellow with the Office of the Chief Clinical Information Officer, who is our very first guest um, on the panel today. I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, so look, I hope you are excited to be joining us for a discussion around how digitization is affecting health. And when you think about humans, uh, one of our Our basic needs and rights is to be and I guess over the last two years health has really dominated the political cultural and social agenda uh, which has made um, digital health work more relevant and important than ever and I guess when you think about digital technology in health it's not around optimizing the algorithm or selling your holiday we can literally save people uh, to discuss this with us uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you are. And I've tried to get a mix of people uh, uh, from uh, uh, academia uh, and health services. I'm going to run this very informally. I'm going to ask our, our panel experts to really give us five minutes on their views of how digitization is affecting health. And I'd like you all to put questions in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to pose those questions to our panels to really promote a bit of lively discussion. I want this to be informal and conversational in tone. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Keith McNeil. Um, Keith, I'd be delighted if you could introduce yourself uh, and give us uh, a brief pricey of your view on the way that digitization is affecting health. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And, and hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be talking to you. So right now, um, my background is as a transplant physician, a heart and lung transplants. So I spent many years working in Cambridge uh, and ended up there being CEO and then head of IT and CCIO for, um, for the NHS before coming back to Queensland, where I've now been involved working with Claire in building our, building our digital uh, ecosystem across Queensland. Um, it, it strikes me from the experience I've had, I've been in medicine now for 40 years, that uh, as we strive more and more to, um, to make ground in the safety and quality agenda, elimination of waste, variation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that uh, despite all of our best efforts, we are really struggling now to close uh, that, that gap up. Uh, and the only game in town is better use of the data and information that we're generating in increasing amounts every day. Uh, and... I know from personal experience that the better we can use data uh, and get that data and information to frontline decision makers, uh, the more chance we're going to have of delivering what is high quality sustainable healthcare, moving towards the precision medicine agenda, which of course both our countries are, are embracing significantly. I was involved in the 100,000 genome project set up in the UK and now back here with the Australian genomics and what we've done in Queensland. Uh, underpinning all of that is, is data and information. Uh, and if we can build the ecosystems that enable us to generate the data, to aggregate it, to intelligently analyze it, and then use that as a source of truth for delivering direct care for business intelligence, for improving population health metrics and, and understanding, uh, and for research, uh, then we'll, we'll take those quantum leaps that we need uh, in terms of better health care. Thanks, Keith. And I guess it's pertinent to reflect um, and Keith's been quite modest there, but he's also the Deputy Director General of the Prevention Division. Queensland Health as such was in the COVID response. And, and Keith, um, I guess the question that anyone in this room would be interested in is, has what has the impact of COVID been um, on digitisation? And how do you think we would have gone in COVID without it? Well, that's a great question, you know, and uh, I've often said one of the silver linings of, of COVID has been has been taking the 20% of us who are sort of rabid enthusiasts for data and information uh, and really uh, spread the secret sauce around. And <laughs> now it's, eight, it's, it's 80 or 90% of people who just realise you cannot respond to a pandemic without timely, I mean, near real time um, access to really high quality information. And so people who never would have thought to ask for information uh, in real time before have suddenly turned around and said they want high quality, real time, longitudinal linked data sets so they can make informed decisions about how they should respond to the pandemic and all of the complex uh, inter interdependencies that, that go into that response. Uh, and you can't do it without, uh, without it. So, you know, there, there has been a real investment in both in terms of, uh, of um, emotional energy 
uh, and time, as well as in funding to enable us to put together ever increasing uh, links data sets. And, and the, the, the real joy has been that if you, you don't have to think too far um, a field to, to understand how doing this for COVID can be scaled to doing it for really any disease process or any population level or any response at any level of, um, of the healthcare system. So it's been a, um, it's been a shot in the arm, that's for sure, to use a, a pun uh, to do with uh, COVID. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, that's a beautiful um, summary, I think, of what in at the moment and um, the acceleration that COVID has applied or the secret sauce, as you call it, um, to me has just been remarkable uh, to watch. Um, feel free if you've got questions for Keith um, around any specific um, component or any other burning questions, uh, put them in the chat and we will circle back um, at the end of uh, the speaker introductions. Uh, I'd now like to turn over to Professor Nancy Picana. Um, Nancy, I'll ask you to introduce yourself uh, and give us your views on the topic. Claire, thank you so much and hello to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to speak. Um, I'm Nancy Pahana and I'm a clinical geropsychologist and all of my research is on older adults and that's the lens I'm going to bring to this today. I'm the Director of Healthy Aging Initiatives in the Health and Behavioral Sciences faculty. And I'm also UQ's lead on our age-friendly university initiatives. UQ is the first age-friendly university in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's part of the World Health Organization's ecosystem, uh, age-friendly universities, age-friendly hospitals, age-friendly communities. And this is really important. This is the decade of healthy aging. And digitization has a, an immense role to play in helping people uh, have the second half of life that they want to, to age positively and with good health. But so often our views of how to use digital technologies have been shaped by sort of a deficit model of aging and also a paternalistic model of aging. So we use digital devices to have surveillance of people in their homes. Are they gonna fall? Um, we monitor people and we do things to older people. We don't do things with older people. And therein lies both the challenge and the opportunity that digital revolutions offer. You can do amazing things. I have done amazing things um, with older adults, co-designing technology solutions together. So for example, um, we've had a project looking at um, people who have to give up driving and offering a clinical uh, pathway that people can then navigate their um, neighborhoods and cities without having to rely on cars. And uh, we track this um, with the older person through technology that was um, co-developed with us with um, CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial research organization of Australia, but it's all co-designed with older people. So they tell us things like how they want the buttons positioned on the devices and privacy concerns. Maybe they don't want to have certain bits of data um, monitored. So we're doing everything in partnership so that then we can each share the results openly. It's not just a one-way system, but we need to imagine beyond that, I think we need to imagine what sorts of information the older person might want that actually ties into their health goals. So we're working on a really exciting project looking at how hearing aid devices can be used to help the older person not only to hear better, but these devices can pick up things like conversations, you know, talking to older people and social interactions are really key to staving off dementia and improving health. What if the device could tell you things like, you've increased the number of positive conversations you've had with older people 20% this week, or you haven't been talking as much with people this week as last week, is there anything going on? Imagine that kind of feedback. It's sort of the next generation of, I feel, wearable devices. So I'm going to end there, but the challenge is how can we create a better digital health future with older people? 
Well, that's fantastic. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Nancy, put them in the chat. But Nancy, I'm going to pull a little thread there. Um, so there is a stereotype, um, which I'm assuming is incorrect, of people being two things with digital technology. One is um, unable to use it or unwilling to learn. Mm -hmm. And the second is suspicious around privacy in a way that um, the Gen Zs do not stand. Um, their life is on Facebook. Um, so I'd be interested in you addressing those two stereotypes. So firstly, reluctance to adopt new technology and early when it is adopted fears around uh, privacy and, and a personal anecdote an elderly relative of mine was worried about my health record um, and her privacy being invaded and I said what's in there that you're worried about and it was you know hypertension um, you know nothing at all that that would be considered by our generation to be sensitive or particularly controversial so I'm interested in your thoughts around that because as we age and our um, demographics change these two issues to me are going to be critical so I would encourage everybody on this call to, when you're when you're finished with this event, Google older gamer. <laughs> and people who've been gaming for the last 40 years. Uh, it's very instructive, right? So older people, yes, older people. I've also met uh, younger people who can't navigate around anything on a computer, right? So this is an ageist stance. This is very um, deleterious to both progress in society and research. Uh, I've recently put in a grant application to co-design an app with residents in an aged care facility to help people um, better adapt to the environment. It was sort of like a welcome concierge app, very sophisticated. What does the government reviewer say? Older people can't use apps, mm -hmm. even though the government has made everything an app, the COVID thing, an app, right? So, you know, it's fine for them to do it, but when I want to do it with older people, they don't want to do it. The second thing is about privacy. I think that's really interesting because I've had older people say, you know, I have concerns about Facebook. I have concerns mm. about Google, about data harvesting, right? That's, that's a real concern, mm. right? Yeah. So mm. I think we have to, sometimes we listen to the concerns that older people bring and we look at it through an ageist lens. Mm. Sometimes older people complain about apps because they're terrible apps. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. That, that's and I've just uh, clicked on older gamers, and they are way cool. And it is my hope to be an older gamer one day. I'm totally lining up for that. Just, just you'll see me there. Yeah, awesome. Um, that's fantastic. All right. Um, I'd now like to introduce Professor David Weller. Uh, David, uh, we're delighted to welcome you, and thank you for getting up so early in the morning. Um, I'd be thrilled if you would introduce yourself and and tell us your um, view. I think on digitization and healthcare. Thanks a lot, Claire. And uh, first of all, I haven't got up early in the morning. I'm sitting at University of Queensland. At the moment. I'm, I'm visiting you. So. Um, but um, yeah, so I run the uh, Department of General Practice, which is part of the Usher Institute uh, at the University of Edinburgh. I don't sound like I come from the University of Edinburgh. I'm originally from Adelaide and I trained in medicine uh, and then in, uh, in general practice in South Australia before uh, moving over there uh, about, uh, about 22 years ago. Just wanted to share a few thoughts with you. First of all, um, uh, you know, primary care in many ways is at, at the centre of this debate because, you know, we all get sick and generally the first port of call is, is primary care. And the way that primary care responds uh, to, to people's needs, um, uh, if it can do so in a data-driven way, I think that's, that's a very sort of desirable sort of result. So when COVID hit, it was... It, it, in both Australia and the UK, for general practice and primary care, it was like getting hit by an express train. All of a sudden, you know, our work life and our patients' um, uh, expectations were, were just just completely thrown up in the air. Uh, we suddenly closed. We we closed the door of our surgery. We hadn't done that in in, in twenty years. It, it, it felt horrible. We sent out messages saying that well, people that you know, people interpreted. Uh, as, as thinking that the NHS uh, was closed uh, was closed for business. And um, uh, so what did we do to sort of mitigate against that? Well, a big part of it uh, was around uh, digitization. Um, and it wasn't anything new really, but it was all things that were there, but it just really gave us a, a, a kick up the backside and, uh, <laughs> and got us moving, got us moving. Um, so, I mean, first of all, with telephone triage, um, you know, we, we learnt uh, how to try and do more on the telephone. 
uh, and to, you know, to, to meet people's needs that way and to try and understand better who needed to be seen face to face. Um, there, um, uh, there have been video platforms around for a while, but we hadn't used them. Uh, a lot more of us uh, uh, took, uh, took, took them up. Um, and it, you know, in general, the whole sort of the, the, the primary care data infrastructure and our usage of it um, uh, really uh, sort of moved along. Um, and, and I think it was a great example of how health systems can adapt um, to, uh, to, to, an, to an acute situation. So I'd like to put it to the group that uh, there is an ideal when it comes to, uh, to primary care and, and, and data. Uh, and what we think we're moving uh, uh, moving towards, but one a service where you get your questions answered day or night uh, by a trusted service. Now that might be a, a chat bot in the first instance. You know, in China there are uh, boxes that you can walk into, feed in your symptoms, and and, and get an answer. It might be uh, speaking to a to, to a human, but we we're you know experimenting with those AI um, procedures. Wouldn't it be great to uh, get get appointments scheduled online or diagnostic tests, not rather than having to just take potluck with what it gets uh, sent to you? Re uh, renew prescriptions uh, online. Uh, always have ex have access to to your healthcare records. Have your data uh, securely stored and uh, properly curated, um, but uh, you know used to alert you to changes in. Um, in, in medications or, uh, or new options that might have become uh, available uh, to you. Uh, get uh, be um, able to enroll in trials, giving you access to latest uh, innovations. Uh, and for, for, for clinicians, uh, personalized decision support in, in real time, you know, based, on, uh, based on big data, uh, without having to go, uh, go into Google, but to have uh, uh, data sets help uh, make make our, uh, our our decisions and to have information systems uh, joined up um, uh, because you know a lot of I think what we've been discussing today or will be discussing is about uh, when that when there is that sort of lack of join up between different parts of information uh, uh, information systems and and have our health service continuously monitor outcomes and experience uh, assess you know do do that on a sort of ongoing uh, on ongoing basis. Now, I'm not saying that there are lots of pitfalls in all, in all of this. Uh, and, you know, we know that uh, it can potentially um, enhance uh, health inequalities. And oddly enough, we're just beginning to get it, at least in the UK, that you've got to put the, the patient at the centre of all of this. Too often we design these um, no, these new you. systems around, uh, you know, around diseases or places. So putting the patient at the centre is 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 critical. So they're my uh, they're my aspirations. I'd like to like to put to you, and I'd uh, uh, hope that uh, primary care in, uh, in in ten years time can embrace uh, can, can be embracing some of them, whilst uh, still addressing issues of trust and confidentiality, um, which are obviously central to all of this. Uh, look, that's a fantastic um, summary, David. And um, there's a wonderful question there from Amelia. Um, asking if Scotland is ahead of the game um, from the more densely populated areas in the UK. Um, okay, well, because it's always been regional, largely populated areas. Is that is that a driver for your success, or how has yes. that panned out? Well, it's a prerequisite of living in Scotland that you you say that we're ahead of the game in everything. So, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I think I, you're I, still Australian, David. I think that that's Shamozi coming through there. Oh, sorry. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, there, there's a, there's a few advantages in in uh, in Scotland. Uh, number one, we do have a, a so a, a dispersed population. So that's uh, caused us to um, be innovators in in telemedicine. And you know when uh, I mean our rural and remote is is Shetland Island or or, or the Orkneys, uh, not Western Queensland, but the issues are just the same. So uh, that has uh, spurred a lot of innovation in that sort of area. Um, the other thing is our is the curation of our databases, and because Scotland is a relatively small country, I think we've been able to get uh, connection between uh, various kinds of databases, whether that's disease registers or treatment databases. Uh, screening databases more 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 effectively. So there's you know some advantages in um, 
in, in, in sort of being a relative, uh, relatively small place with a relatively straightforward NHS infrastructure. Yeah. In, in England, it's just so incredibly massive and complex. To, yeah, so I'd like to think we are a bit ahead. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm now going to introduce my good colleague, um, Professor Nicole Gillespie, and she's really going to pull the thread that uh, some of the speakers have raised around a trust. So, Nicole, if you'd like to introduce yourself um, and elaborate on your lens um, of how digital health uh, has impacted society, we'd be so grateful. Sure. Thanks so much, Claire, and hello to everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, so, I'm a professor of management at uh, UT Business School. Uh, my background and training is in organisational psychology, and I currently hold the KPMG Chair in Organisational Trust. Um, I've been working um, in the health space for some time as an investigator in the UQ Centre for Research Excellence in Telehealth, um, and more recently working on several projects looking at trust and emerging technology um, with a very talented team here at UQ. Um, so I'm going to bring a trust lens to the conversation today. Um, in particular, focusing on some recent research we've been doing, looking at um, trust in AI at enabled healthcare. So AI is a, this cornerstone of what's been called the fourth industrial revolution. It's impacting all sectors, but particularly the health sector. Um, and we know that this revolution um, you know, and this incorporation of AI offers immense benefits and opportunities um, for healthcare. Um, we've talked about enabling precision medicine, enhancing the accuracy of medical diagnoses and decision making enhancing the um, efficiency and innovation in solving some really some of our most pressing um, uh, health challenges. Um, we've seen AI helping to fight you know, COVID-19 by simulating and predicting spread patterns, helping to detect mutations in the, in the virus as well. Um, but I guess on the flip side of this is that we also know that um, the use of AI and emerging tech and healthcare does create trust challenges as well. Um, one of these is the potential for codifying and entrenching bias. Um, so, for example, in the US, there was an AI system that was designed to refer high-risk patients into personalised care programs, but it was actually found to have a racial bias embedded in its algorithm. Um, and this resulted in systemic discrimination um, towards African-Americans and their access to health care. Um, another key concern and trust challenge here is obviously around data privacy and security. You know, there have been instances where public health data sets have been inappropriately shared. Um, there's also concerns around explainability and the kind of black box nature of um, machine learning algorithms um, and what that means for accountability for decisions supported by those systems. Um, and another concern um, more broadly is around de-skilling of healthcare workers and the potential for over-reliance on AI and decision-making, potentially even technological unemployment. Um, so we have for example, seeing AI enabled imaging replacing um, a lot of human radiographers. Um, so essentially, you know, these risks and concerns are challenging trust in the use of AI and emerging technique, uh, emerging technologies um, in a variety of areas, but in particular also in healthcare. So um, we conducted some research recently looking at um, trust in AI applications across five countries, um, including the UK, Australia, the USA, Canada, and Germany. So in total, we sampled um, nationally representative samples of over 6,000 people, 1,200 in each country. And one of the questions we asked was the extent to which people trust in these AI systems. Um, and in particular, we looked at um, trust in health yeah, AI systems to, to support the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Now, the good news here is that people are more trusting of AI use in healthcare than any of the other contexts that we examined. Um, however, trust in the use of AI systems in healthcare is actually still low. Um, so we found that 63% of people are either unwilling or ambivalent about trusting in healthcare AI systems. And in particular, we found that they're concerned about relying on the output or recommendations from these systems. They're more comfortable with sharing information, I think, because typically we're used to sharing quite sensitive information with our healthcare providers. Um, so just to give you an example of some of the concerns around accuracy here, um, we found that 56% of Australians um, believe that um, disease misdiagnosis from AI systems would impact large numbers of Australians in, over the next decade. Um, now, in saying that, most people perceive that the benefits of integrating AI into healthcare outweigh the risks, um, which was not the case for other types of applications of AI. So there's, that's um, supportive of the use of AI in healthcare. We also found younger generations, particularly Gen Z and millennials, 
as well as those who are university educated, um, tended to be more trusting of the incorporation of these systems in healthcare. So I guess one of the implications here is that if this low trust is, is left unaddressed, then it will probably impair our ability to realise, you know, the quite enormous potential benefits, both health, societal, even economic, of integrating AI into healthcare. Um, another one of our key findings here spoke, speaks to who's trusted to develop, use and govern AI. Um, and what we found here was that people are most confident in universities and research institutions um, to develop, use and even govern these um, systems. They're more trusted than commercial and tech companies and more trusted than the government to do this. So I think one of the implications of that findings is the potential to partner that healthcare institutions and government you know, health agencies um, can partner with universities and research institutions um, and leverage off that trust that comes with, with that. The other kind of area I wanted to emphasize was um, our research really highlighted that people have very clear expectations of the principles and practices that need to be in place to trust in um, healthcare systems that incorporate AI. Um, so we use the European Commission seven principles of trustworthy AI, and we found really strong endorsement for all of these. We even developed a set of practices to really um, bring to life those principles. And we had 95% of our respondents across those 6,000 um, strongly endorsing that these are important for trust. So that's really around robust performance and accuracy of these systems, the data privacy, security and governance, that appropriate human um, agency and oversight, uh, appropriate transparency and explainability, the fairness element, ensuring no bias, and also clear accountability and contestability mechanisms are really important there, as well as you know, understanding how to um, mitigate potential risks. So we feel that this offers a, a blueprint in some ways for how to integrate these systems in a way which would you know, derive broad stakeholder trust. Um, the real challenge I think is embedding those in the everyday practices and developing, designing and using these systems on the ground. Um, great, Nicole, that was such a masterclass um, on, on, on trust in AI, really. Um, so there's been a couple of questions from our participants around um, the bias in the algorithms uh, and people wanting to hear a little bit um, around that. And I, I noticed Keith's come off um, mute, which is always a bit of a worry as well. So Keith, did you want to chime in there and then we'll go back to Nicole? Yeah, no, just, just to say that, that we're running into these issues, uh, you know, for, for access to, um, to data and whatnot where AI is involved. Um, because data custodians are asking for details of, of how decisions are made so that they can ensure there's accuracy. Uh, and it's clear to me that traditional, um, traditional ethics committees, traditional data custodianship is not fit for purpose in, in this world, and that we need specialist data uh, ethics committees, data access governance committees to be able to consider these questions, because to, to the vast majority of us, AI is a black box and we we take what comes out of the end of it with um, with something of a leap of faith. Um, we have to have faith in the processes that have gone into that. Uh, and, but we are at a point now where we can continuously and iteratively and in real time evaluate outcomes. Uh, and, and so we can, we can machine learn around the outcomes from AI to make sure that it's doing what we think it's doing uh, and achieving the outcomes that we're doing. But it, it is gonna challenge us for a while as we get our systems into the 21st century. And Keith, I think that's because many of the HREC committees um, or human research um, ethics committees were set up with traditional randomised control trials in mind. And now, Nicole, you're coming to them with, you know, an AI algorithm. And this is new and emerging. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's technology so we're, we're in so it really came to my mind because I had to just fill in an application for an NHMRC grant and it said how many randomized control trials have you been in how many publications have you done how much funding and I was fine for funding I was fine for publications and when it came to RCTs I had to put a big fat zero because I've got none but that doesn't mean I'm not creating new knowledge so um, Nicole um, did you want to comment on on the question of bias yeah, look, I think Keith's point is really well made. And just to go back to our um, survey findings, we actually find that people say that they will trust in the use of AI systems more when there's what we call structural assurance mechanisms in place. And one of the key ones there that we looked at was um, the use of an independent AI ethical review board. 
And part of what that board should be doing is um, really looking at, you know, have the data sets been cleaned appropriately? Are the data sets comprehensive? Um, you know, have we made sure that there's no bias by looking at the outcomes before we're, of course, using this to check for bias? So there are ways to check for what's called unfair bias in the data sets and in the algorithm and output um, before actually, of course, using these. Um, so there's quite a lot of different techniques there. Um, but again, I think, um, you know, just that awareness of what, are, what, what these critical processes are and recognising that the governance and the sort of risk management, if you like, and ethical oversight of these systems is really very different to traditional, um, you know, rule-bound systems. So there are a whole lot of different challenges and potential risks. So we really need to have, different, you know, new and um, ways of really thinking about the governance um, of this. And of course, there's been a lot of inroads into that. Um, but I think there's still healthcare institutions in really understanding um, the responsibility and managing this and what to look for. Oh, thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm going to move now to industry. And um, we're delighted to talk to Eric Culling um, from Striker International to the panel. Um, we've heard from uh, healthcare delivery. We've heard from academia. Um, I think now it's the time to hear from our industry partners. So um, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Claire. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for inviting and having me on this on this panel. Um, so as we see a seismic shift in healthcare and technology that requires us to adapt actually in new ways. So what got us here won't get us there. And then at Striker, we recently also updated our business model as well and established a new organization called Digital Robotics Enabling Technologies. Uh, called Dre, uh, where I'm leading the uh, global data intelligence team. And I'm focused on data engineering, data analytics, data science, and uh, computer vision. Uh, my computer vision team is based in, in Manchester, UK, so a close link to, to, the, to the UK uh, uh, friends here. Um, so this Dre entity is designed to work across the enterprise with each of our business units and to ele elevate enterprise weight capabilities and accelerate innovation actually similar to the challenges uh, of a digital transformation in healthcare systems. Strike is a decentralized company. However, we need to bridge the silos and connect devices and data everywhere. Um, like for example, in Striker, we have like more than 85 digital solutions across the continuum of care, and they are all delivering value to our customers. And these innovations like the Mako robot for hip and knee art plus D, connected beds, connected ORs, advanced 3D navigation systems for spine and, 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 and so on and so forth. They delivering our customers value, but how about tomorrow? These 85 solutions aren't speaking to each other. They aren't synchronized. They aren't connected. They aren't maximizing their full potential. Uh, and that's why we established this new entity to look beyond what exists today and imagine new frontiers of medical technology. So maybe look between the stars as was earlier mentioned. How can we leverage behaviors, best practices, and technology outside of medicine? Things like predictive analytics and machine learning to improve outcomes and economic benefit. Things like augmented reality and computer vision to improve operational efficiencies. Things like remote sensors to improve both patient and customer experience. Just imagine the power of digital transformation when it's connected from an ambulance to the hospital, to the OR, to the recovery, to physical therapy, you know, to all the post-operative checkups, one, two, three year post-operatively. And that's why we have set up this, this, this new entity to enable us to deliver potential that value to our customers. Um, so although we have solutions and we have innovate, digital innovations at the continuum of care in healthcare and also at Striker, we don't seem to have a seamless solutions connected throughout this continuum of care or in, in healthcare in general. Um, and again, the establishment of DRE allows us to hopefully connect all our devices, to connect with uh, other data sources within hospitals, in healthcare systems in general. Um, and also, it enables also to partner with global partners more effectively, like the global R&D hub we have based here in Queensland. And we are really proud to, uh, to be a partner um, of, of Queensland University there. Uh, that allows us to work with, you know, world leading Australian universities to work on novel medical research within this Australian medtech uh, and healthcare system. 
So that is that is where we are, and that's what we're trying to achieve uh, as a company moving forward and improving digital and improving um, healthcare for our customers. Eric, I think the approach that Strike has taken is a little unusual in some ways, because Striker is deliberately partnering with universities and health providers rather than taking a traditional commercial approach, which would be to try to develop anything in house. And I'm just reflecting back on Nicole's comments. Um, why is Striker taking that approach? Um, it might make more commercial sense to try to do it all yourself in house. So why are you taking this, this method? Well, well, absolutely. I mean, it is indeed, a, I would say, the traditional way of developing new innovations as a company. You will, companies like to own IP, like to control, like to manage everything themselves. However, we feel it's important to partner with external stakeholders, whether that are university, academia, that healthcare governments as well, because we can't uh, deliver these solutions without the help, without the input, without the expertise of all the external stakeholders that are involved in delivering new digital innovations in, in healthcare. So without partners, without strong partners, we will not be able to deliver the solutions uh, and to develop the solutions that will indeed uh, create more customer value. So it's it's in, in basically in our interest to partner. Without external partners, we won't be able to deliver those those solutions. And that's quite disruptive, I suspect, to industry at large. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. It is very yes, it, it's a very interesting journey we're going through at the moment at Striker, and and again looking forward and really look, uh, looking forward to uh, to partner with, uh, for example, Queensland indeed to uh, to go through this uh, this cultural and digital transformation. I'm going to turn now to, um, I guess, a younger um, member of the board. And I'm privileged uh, to have um, somebody a little bit younger because I might be one of Nancy's old gamers by the time digital technology is truly um, introduced. Uh, and so I'm excited and excited to welcome Dr. Peter Worthy um, to the panel. Peter, we'd be excited to hear about your views on this topic. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not actually younger. I actually think I'm probably <laughs> one of the older people, but I'm younger in terms of academic years, so maybe that counts instead. So in my background, um, I was a lawyer for about 20 years and practiced law and then decided that I needed a change and discovered interaction design and human-centered computing. Uh, and I guess that's where my path kind of moved into this space. And so my PhD, I actually looked at the design of Internet of Things technology. And what, what does the design of that technology, how does it look, how does it work, what does it do? How does that actually impact people? Um, and what are the range of impacts that it has on humans? Uh, and that's, I think, where I kind of started this journey, where I think understanding that technology has a range of potentials. And there's certainly, as Her Excellency said, there's a dark side to some of this sort of stuff. And I think what it's been for me is this kind of interesting journey on, even for myself, a personal epiphany on how many biases and how many misconceptions I had in my life. Um, so the first project I wanted to talk about was a collaboration with the University of Exeter, supported by the Quake Scheme, which was really good. And we looked at this issue of older people and how they use technology for social connectedness. It was kind of timely because it ran during the period of COVID. So it was really nice uh, to actually get those perceptions. And what's really interesting is, is you bust the myth straight away. Uh, people use technology, doesn't matter how old or young they are. And people don't use technology, doesn't matter how old or young they are. That's what Nancy said. But what we see is that people use it for many different ways and it means many different things for different people. Um, so grabbing a phone, an old phone, and using SMS to stay in touch with people around the world can still mean a lot to a person. It doesn't have to be fancy technology. But at the same time, someone can grab a platform like Facebook or Instagram and connect with an identity of themselves where they're an activist and they can be part and they can support that, that kind of part of their identity. So I guess what we need to do when we start playing in this digital space, particularly around health, is to understand that what does technology do for people? Sometimes it can amplify, sometimes it can reduce, sometimes it can inhibit and sometimes it can invite. So we've got to really understand that. One of the projects where this became really um, kind of a hit home for me was I was working on a project where we were looking at designing technology with 
people who are living with dementia. And as Nancy said, co-design is um, probably one of the most rewarding approaches to the design of technology and delivers fantastic designs at the end of the day. But we came into that process with this idea, we're gonna make this technology for you and it's gonna be fantastic. And by working with people right from the outset of that process, right from the outset of our research, um, they pretty much told us straight up that we hate that idea and we would never use it. And so delving into it a bit more, what we started to get was this importance for, um, as Nancy talked about, moving away from a de deficits-based model, moving to a strength-based model. What should technology do for people? And when we talk about what technology does for people, it's not just the everyday achieving tasks. It's around the deeper things like, what does it do for someone's autonomy? What does it do for their sense of connectedness? How does it empower them? Um, how does it support them? not just in the everyday, but in, the, in what they want to do. Uh, and so one of the things that we did in that project was we played around with AI and we started looking at AI. We started using AI to develop a smarter smart home type system. And so we were using knowledge graphs, we we're using natural language processing, all those sorts of things. And as part of our process, we opened the box to people who are living with dementia and said, this is how it works. Um, and despite the misconception that they would go, oh, it's all too complex, it's all too hard, they wanted to know. And in fact, what they wanted was, I want to be able to teach that system. I want to be able to teach it about me um, so that I know that it knows about me. And at the same time, when you talk about things like privacy, they want to be able to control uh, what data is there? They want to understand where did that knowledge come from? How did it work that out about me? But not because they were scared of it, but because they want control of it. People said, I want to be able to choose who I share this with. And I can see the benefit of sharing this with my doctor. I can see the benefit of sharing it with my clinician. Um, but I want to see, I want to know. And so that presented a challenge for us. How do you represent something as complex as a knowledge graph in a way that people can understand? And so we asked them, um, and they came back with, oh, you know, it's kind of like the library of me, where there's these collections, and in those collections, there's specific books and chapters about things about me. And so if we understand how they conceptualize things, then we can make it easier for them to be able to access these sorts of technologies. Currently working on two other projects, well, actually probably about three or four, <laughs> uh, but only two that I tell my supervisors that I'm working on. Um, one's looking at how we can actually make um, a technology platform that's going to support uh, cognitive behavioural therapy for people who are living with dementia and experiencing anxiety. In that project, we're using co-design. And again, we're opening up everything. Um, we, we're taking the view that co-design is about shifting power. What do you want? How do you want this to work? And it's the most insightful process I've ever been involved in. And people who are living with dementia have so much to contribute around the design of technology that makes me feel so much more confident that what I'm going to make is actually going to deliver value and usefulness to people. But the message is it's not just about... Um, the task that it helps people do. It's not just about usability. It's about the whole person sitting within the context of their world and their understanding of the world. And I think taking that understanding and that approach is critical when it comes to trying to design these technologies that will truly help people and advance society in the future. That's great. Thanks, Peter. Um, all right. So um, we've had a few questions in the chat and I'm, I'm going to sort of try and, and summarise them and pose them back to our panel. Um, so if all the panellists uh, could be there. The first theme that's really coming through is around risk. Um, and so whenever you introduce anything new, you are introducing risk. And um, I know many of the panellists here have differing risk appetites. Um, some accept risk as part of their day to day work and others would be horrified to introduce any risk at all to a human and, and that's appropriate that we have a spectrum um, amongst our panel but um, I would like your individual views if you like um, on your perceptions of risk and the introduction of new technologies in Keith uh, in health and I'm going to start with Keith. Yeah thanks Claire I mean this is something that uh, I have been uh, grappling with for some time and the, the reality is there is no situation where there is no risk there is a risk in doing nothing and accepting the status quo there is a huge risk in doing that so what we're talking about 
is not absolute no risk versus risk, it's relative risk. You know, what are the pros and cons? As you say, what's the counterfactual argument of not doing something? Because that can be very, very harmful to people. And I've got countless examples where um, appropriate uh, availability of information would save lives. And we hang on to it thinking that privacy or, or locking it down uh, mitigates risk of that data being um, kept, kept sacrosanct, which is fine, uh, but we don't step out and look uh, uh, in a more complex world at what the risks of doing that are. Uh, and if our outcome here is to provide better health care uh, and, better, and better patient outcomes, we've got to think long and hard about how we do that in a relative sense. Um, that is so interesting because the count early relative worried about her history of hypertension being leaked out um, was me highlighting that 40% of medication errors are made at the transition point between general practice and hospital or hospital and residential aged care facility. So she's much more likely to have uh, adverse event or death related to her information not being shared than she is it being shared. Um, and it took, you know, that was quite confronting to her because she could only see the risk of her information didn't at all understand the risk of her information not being shared. So, so thank you, Keith. Um, Nancy, interested in your thoughts on that. I think, um, I mean, I would share Keith's view that, you know, there is nothing in the world that doesn't have risk. Um, but as Peter said, you know, people want to understand what's going on with these systems. They want to understand the safeguards. They want to understand, and each individual has their own tolerance of risk. So you can have older people that have huge, you know, they'll risk, they're not risk averse at all. And younger people are very risk averse, right? So we have to also be mindful of stereotypes we bring to the risk issue. So is that conversation happening when you're asking people around how they want the information to be shared? Is the counterfactual model about what would happen if not bed also discussed? Are you asking me? It, I, I, I don't think enough people, I, I don't think that enough is shared. You know, there's, there's a lot of data that, that suggests that, it, I, I'm just talking about older people, that the amount of information they get goes down Actually, the, the amount of, of stuff they get goes down because people just oh they they won't understand it, you know. And I think we have to break out of that model so we can invite people in and design these systems um, that have greater uptake. For example, no, that's great. Thanks, Nancy. David, you must come across this um, quite a bit. Yes, and there's um, in primary care. There's uh, I, I just resonate with the previous uh, speakers you know there's a, a tremendous variation in uh, in people's tolerance of, of risk but you know sometimes it's well founded uh, you know we've we're getting into uh, using um, wearable devices they can sometimes send um, uh, wrong, wrong information um, we're asking people to send in photos of rashes via email, can we 100% guarantee that those, you know, rashes will just stay with us, and <laughs> those photos will stay with us, and no, and uh, nowhere else? And we're asking people to, um, for uh, permission to upload their entire data sets uh, into centralised primary care data sets for, to, to talk to other data sets around the uh, the the NHS, and that uh, you know that n nothing nothing is uh, is fail safe. But just to pick up on Keith's point, um, you. Know, the, the huge campaign at the moment um, in in uh, in the UK is 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 based around data saves lives. And I think that's uh, you know that's uh, made it to um, or that that's present in Australia as well. And, and I think that's um, a conversation that we in primary care need to have with a lot more of our patients, just because they don't immediately understand that uh, that that. Uh, you, you know the, how a, a centralized database can actually save uh, save someone's life but when you do explain it um, it uh, is often quite uh, quite enlightening I don't think we need to just reassure people about risk I think we need to have an open and transparent conversation about uh, about risk with them and and and, and perhaps you know, get into some sort of partnership with them because you know we don't want to hoodwink them into into thinking if something is risk risk free it needs to be you know an open, very open sort of open dialogue that's right and it's relative risk isn't it nothing is risk free yeah uh, yeah. yeah nicole 
Yeah, so look, um, trust actually is only really relevant under conditions of risk. So if you really think about what trust is, it's actually the willingness to be vulnerable and we're willing to be vulnerable to our health practitioners or in sharing our data because we have confident, positive expectations about their intentions and what they're going to do for us. Um, so I think in many ways, um, you know, there's, I agree absolutely with what David was just saying there. Um, our data would suggest that people are much more willing to accept that risk when they feel like they understand what's going on. Um, so, you know, can we have some campaigns helping to educate the public around emerging tech in health and why it's so good? Um, also when they're familiar, so when they've been through the cycle. So with, you know, with telehealth, you know, there were big barriers, but then COVID came along and then suddenly everyone started to <laughs> use it. And then suddenly that's kind of solved a lot of the trust issues, right? You know, necessity is the mother of all invention in many ways. So, so I think that that's also, but then also those structural assurances. So regulation, so people don't necessarily feel that, that all the regulation and those structural assurances are in place. So just reassuring them of that. And that's where I think we can do that at multiple levels. You know, GPs can do that with their patients, but also, you know, healthcare institutions and organizations can go about trying to help educate, but also signal, hey, you know, with all of this, we've got all these structural assurances in place, whether they're AI ethics boards, to make sure that this is done. We've cleaned up the data, we know this. So we've got protocols around this, we've got codes of conduct, putting all those governance elements in place that assure people. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, um, Nicole. And I, I think communicating uh, those safeguards is something we probably haven't done very well. Um, and anyone thinks there's none has never had to try to navigate it. That's all I would say. Um, thank you. Eric. Yeah, well, so for us as a company, of course, there are massive risks of introducing new digital innovations. You know, cybersecurity and privacy is our highest priority when we're launching new products in the in the digital space. You know, think about you know the six-fold increase of ransomware attacks in, in healthcare systems. You know, two-thirds of healthcare systems have been you know affected by these ransomware attacks. Um, you know, and we risk as a company huge fines. You know, think about the GDPR fine, like 10% of our global revenue. So, you know, cybersecurity, privacy, the risks are huge for a company uh, and therefore critical to, to address properly um, uh, in this space. And of course, indeed, it is, it's about not only the trust of the patients, uh, um, uh, surgeons, hospitals providing access to their data. We have to make sure that we treat that data securely and, 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 re and, and assure that all the private data is is securely uh, uh, stored in our databases for, for development or indeed uh, machine learning purposes. So yeah, risk are massive, opportunities are big as well, but yeah, it's uh, something we need to deal with. And that's right. And the lens you look through it, whether it's academia, healthcare delivery or industry, um, obviously would change your perception. Um, we are out of time, um, so I would really like to thank uh, the fantastic panel we've had, Professor Keith McNeil, Professor Nancy Pahana, Professor David Weller, Professor Nicole Gillespie, Dr Eric Garling and Dr Peter Worthy. Um, I have learned so much uh, from all of you. It's an absolute um, pleasure to have this conversation with everyone. I hope we've all got some food for thought um, and I'm off to game till I'm old. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Villa um, and um, I am uh, an Associate Professor in the School of Information Technology and Electrical, Electrical Engineering here at UQ, um, where I'm also the leader of our human-centred computing discipline um, and also kind of especially relevant for, uh, for this panel. I'm, I'm also um, UQ's theme leader in the Quex Institute um, that was mentioned by, um, by both of our um, introductions there, which is a collaboration between uh, the University of Queensland and the U University of Exeter in the UK. Um, in relation to that theme, this panel is, is set up to discuss um, issues around um, the natures of um, uh, digital worlds and disruptive technologies and how our kind of understandings of the, the increasingly digitalized world that we live in can be informed by multiple perspectives, um, not just from, um, from the um, sciences and, and technological uh, disciplines, but also from arts and humanities and from the rich background that that brings to, to, to the space. Um, so um, in, in terms of um, how this how this all works together, um, how we can approach um, embracing these technologies um, um, for a future where um, technologies like robotics and mechatronics, information technology and machine learning are linked inextricably, inextricably um, with 
classical languages, ancient history, archaeology, theater, museum studies, and philosophy, and how that prompts us to consider how these technologies will work. So I'm really pleased to have um, a, a great pa uh, panel of, of speakers here today. Um, just very briefly, I'll go, th go through, and then um, each, each panelist will have a very short um, presentation to, to um, discuss their position, and then we'll go to um, open questions um, from the floor um, until we get through and, and run out of time. So our panelists, we have um, Dr. Mishuda Glencross, who's a senior lecturer here in, the, in, in computer science in the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering um, at UQ. We have Jeanette McWilliam, who's a lecturer in the School of Historical and Philosophical, bleh, I should slow down, Philosophical Inquiry um, here at UQ. We have Dr. Gabrielle Galuzzo, who's a senior lecturer in ancient philosophy at the University of Exeter. Dr. Stephen Snow, who is a postdoctoral research fellow here in the School of Architecture at UQ, and Dr. Jasim Harper, who is a lecturer in information security in the Department of Information Security at Royal Holloway University of London. So we will go through the, the speakers in that order. And first, first up um, is Mashuda Glencross. Um, and just a little bit more detail, Mashuda is uh, also part of the human-centered computing discipline that I lead here at UQ. Um, and she leads the graphics and visualization theme in the Center for Energy Data Innovation. Her work is focused on virtual reality, computer games, visual effects, displays, mobile and image-based capture technologies. Over to you, Mashuda. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm just gonna, um, I, I have just a kind of oral uh, position um, statement. So I'm just gonna go through that. So in the late 80s and early 90s, VFX techniques saw a massive rise in both innovation and adoption. Um, Pixar basically forever changed the animation industry with its landmark short movie, Luxo Jr. In parallel, virtual reality, mixed reality, um, shared collaborative environments, gaming technology, etc., were really at the start of their journey as future um, disruptive digital technologies. At the time, all of these relied on pretty significant and costly hardware. Over the last 30 years, the level of progress in these areas have been phenomenal and in parallel, low cost hardware and access to compute services has disrupted the notion of who can create visually compelling 3D content. We have seen a stunning convergence of VFX and gaming technology which has led to visual quality of real-time rendering in game engines today that's broadly equivalent to pre-rendered VFX a decade ago and is catching up fast. Similarly, there have been major advances in the use of AI techniques for rendering, video processing, and 3D content and performance capture. The convergence of these technologies is and will be more than the sum of their parts and far more disruptive, combining both the virtual and the real world seamlessly. So what will this really mean? Today, seeing is already no longer believing and skilled people can make their own compelling VFX with just a little bit of effort. This was showcased last year with the viral deepfake Tom Cruise videos created by VFX artist Chris Oom on TikTok. These were so compelling that many people believed them to be real and their popularity led to the launch of a company last year specializing in making impossible ads and film restoration using AI and VFX. There are also many other recent and well-funded companies in a similar space. Meta's recent experience with inappropriate user behavior on its VR social platform, such as people groping other people's avatars, has already led to thinking about how we convey what is socially acceptable in shared spaces. As these technologies continue their convergence, it's inevitable that tools will emerge to allow anyone with good IT skills to create visually compelling 3D graphics content and share this on a breadth of, uh, of 3D platforms and metaverse platforms. <clears throat> so has the time now come to recognize that these technologies originally intended for controlled use in movies and games are now out of the bag? and that the commoditization of their use creates ethical considerations that both researchers and industry needs to keep in mind when innovating. I argue that the root problem is human 
and that we need more research to help manage human perception and interaction with 3D content sharing platforms that takes account of both the positive perceived use and the potential for misuse of these technologies in a human centric way to err as human and we inherently rely on what we see and hear to confirm our subjective view of reality do we risk amplifying the problem of perception if so then who will we become thanks very much Mishida. Um, on to our next uh, panellist, we have Danette McWilliam. Um, Danette is Director of the R.D. Milne's Antiquities Museum and a lecturer in Classics and Ancient History at UQ. Her research interests lie predominantly in the areas of Greco-Roman socio-cultural history, particularly ancient uh, children and childhood. Um, I just lost my place there. Um, gender and pedagogical approaches to teaching of ancient languages. For example, she teaches Latin with color and technology. She's involved in a project that's funded by the Quex Institute. And as part of this project, she's particularly interested in exploring ideas, sensory perception in the ancient world and, and how they seem to be an important component in creating the theatrically, the, theatricality of ancient wondrous machines. Um, Jenna, over to you. Thank you. you. Can you see, can yes, you see can. my um, PowerPoint? Um, fantastic. Um, I think the uh, last um, introduction ties in really quite well with our project because the idea of human perception and uh, future research um, is sort of showcased by what we're doing because we're looking at um, wondrous machines. And um, so I'm very grateful to the Quex Institute for funding this because we've got people from um, very disparate disciplines who don't generally work together. So people from philosophy, classics and ancient history, robotics and mechatronics, um, ITEE, for example. And so we've got a really interesting um, team that's going on here. And the main um, focus of the um, project is going to be a uh, an exhibition at the R.D. Milne's Antiquities Museum, um, where um, we're going to focus on um, a, a alter, automata, so ancient self-propelled machines. That's going to be the, the focus of it. And then we're going to build the research around this. And we're going to hold a series of public programs in association with the exhibition via um, online webinars. We want to host online research symposia for project staff and postgraduate students and we're um, looking at designing collaborative learning experiences for not only for students at UQ and Exeter but also for uh, school children so I'm hoping um, to have a, a future discussion with STEM punks for example and we might be able to get some online collaboration between the two countries as well in looking at robotics and um, ancient technologies. So what we're looking at um, in general is Hero of Alexandria, uh, who wrote an ancient technical and mathematical um, uh, treatise um, on the making of automata. And what he does is he's purporting to give the instructions on the creation of two types of automaton, which is self-propelling um, machines and so it's very interesting to take this as a starting point and to look at how these supposedly self-propelling machines from the ancient world have inspired a whole lot of discussion over the centuries in terms of philosophy and science and then how um, this has translated into the world of artificial intelligence machine learning and robotics and it's quite often um, popular perception that these areas are only a creation of the modern world, but we're going to show how they actually have their, um, their origins way back even into the Homeric period. So our interdisciplinary team is predominantly from UQ and Exeter, and we want to really demonstrate that our, our modern research um, into these areas and into ancient history as well and philosophy all have their origins in the ancient world, and that this interest has sort of extended for centuries. So what we're going to do is explore the complexity of, of heroes um, 
ancient um, first century mobile shrine is the center of the exhibition and there are other things that we can bring into this. Now I'll just give you a bit of information about the shrine. So this is from the first century um, of the modern era and the sh shrine is supposed to have sprout, a spouted wine and milk, lit fires on altars, rotated miraculous, miraculously by a program of C uh, a sequence of programmable events, and it's supposed to have auto-propelled. So this is, um, we've got some um, models that were built by some of the project team as part of a Leverholm funded uh, project at the University of Glasgow. So Dr. Duncan Keenan-Jones was invo involved in this and Professor Ruffle as well um, from the University of Glasgow, and they're all going to be involved in this. So we're going to explore ancient artefacts from the RD Mills Antiquities Museum in conjunction with 3, uh, 3D printed components of this 2016 model of this wondrous machine. And we're going to um, do um, components of the machine. We're going to pull them, the, uh, the ancient machine apart and demonstrate how these simple components, such as falling weights, screws, cords, pulleys, and axles might have been used to create the complex and spectacular machines by ancient engineers. And then in turn, how these simple components have been developed in the modern world. And um, Professor Pauline um, Pounds from um, Robotics at UQ is currently developing a biped robot, which is going to be part of the machine. And you see on your screen here, one of the earlier models, she's actually got a second generation of this um, that she's working on now. So that's going to be very exciting as we look at how these technologies uh, were developed in the ancient culture and the modern culture. And the interesting thing that we've got um, to discuss, I think here is quite often, these um, ancient machines have been decided, uh, described as either philosophical tools or useless toys. Um, and then they've been occasionally looked at as scientific tools. But I think more recently, modern um, scholarship has really looked at how they worked in the ancient world and how um, you've got these um, machines that are not only looking at technology, but they're doing things like um, working on sense, sensory perception and the uh, different types of um, experiences um, through the technologies that have a re religious component as well. So there's all sorts of things that we're really very excited to explore and showcase. And it's this idea of human perception that's really, I think, ties in very well and how human perception and use of these machines do bring into question a lot of the things that we're going to discuss today. So thank you. And if you'd like to come to the exhibition, it's going to open in September and feel free to join our mailing list if you'd like to keep in contact with us. So thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. A nice, a nice overview of the project and an illustration of how these different, um, quite wildly different disciplines can come together um, with projects like this. Thank you. Our next panelist, Gabriel Galuzzo, um, also involved in the project, specializes in ancient Greek philosophy and in particular in Aristotle and the reception of Aristotle. Um, he's gonna briefly sketch out um, ancient frameworks for thinking about the relationship between human beings and technology with a particular reference to the philosophical aspects. Gabriel. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for, for the introduction. As Jeanette was saying, anxiety about technology, its boundaries and its use is not just a modern experience or notion. Actually, the ancient world, both the Greek and the Roman world, offers many examples of many thoughts about the difficult negotiation between human beings and the natural world of which human beings are supposed to be part and the technology they produce. This negotiation involved, uh, involves anxiety about the technology and its implication at both practical and theoretical level. By practical, I mean that technological innovations and productions pose challenges to the ancient world in as much as the same way as they do to the modern world. And these challenges, be they disruptive or short of that, invite responses that affect the way people live. By a theoretical level, I mean that the relationship with technology remains difficult to define and different philosophical views about how this relationship should be construed uh, are present in the ancient world. 
and give origin to rather different understandings of the role of technology in people's lives and conceptual frameworks. In Exeter, in the Department of Classics and Ancient History, we are particularly interested in, st in studying the complex relationship between human beings and technology in the ancient world. We study this topic with reference to many aspects, including medicine and the technological innovations in medical treatment, diagnosis and prosthetic interventions, but also philosophical ideas about technology and finally even cosmetic te technology and mod bodily manipulations in general. Today, uh, I just want to give you a brief sketch uh, of what I sort of work on, on the ideas that uh, shape my work, which are mainly philosophical, as Stephen was saying, I'm an ancient philosophy scholar and historical in some sense, because I'm interested in tracing the, the development of ideas through a rather, rather long chronological span. In terms of general framework, by the time Plato and Aristotle write 4th century BC, the distinction between nature and technology is sufficiently well established. Roughly speaking, nature and natural things have aims and ends that are independent of human beings' interests and aims, while technological products and artifacts are human creations or respond to human beings' interests and aims. This may be true at a very general level, but how to describe, how to define the relationship between nature and technology in general? I want to sketch out very briefly three ideas from the ancient world. They may help us to put into focus this sort of difficult issue. The first idea is the notion of technology as an imitation of nature, as an imperfect reproduction of nature's functioning. This is Plato's and Aristotle's idea, which becomes standard in the classical and Hellenistic period. On this view, the relationship between human beings and technology remains harmonious only at the price of making technology entirely dependent on human beings and subservient to their aims. But actually for Plato, for instance, there is an intrinsic risk in trusting artificial production in general. His views on art, for instance, are well known, but, and, but they're based on the idea that art presupposes that we mistake the copy in some sense for the original. A second idea sees technology as a complement of nature. Technology improves on nature in the sense of producing things that are not produced naturally. This idea surfaces, surprisingly to some extent, in Aristotle and runs parallel to the notion of technology as imitation. This is the stage in which, in some sense, there is a division of labor between human beings and technology. Technology does what nature cannot do. The notion that technology imitates nature is still present in some sense, but is at least accompanied by the different idea that technology supplements and complements nature. Later on in the ancient world, in the imperial period, the idea gains currency of technology as a way of transforming nature and working on it. Here, the traditional boundaries between the natural and the artificial becomes blurred, and difficult questions and consequent anxieties arise as to what is natural and what is technological. The relationship between human beings and nature becomes necessarily less harmonious as human beings um, disrupt nature through technology and technological innovations alter our nature for good. Perhaps this is still the world we live in. I want to end very briefly by mentioning one thing I'm particularly interesting, interested in, namely in my work as an ancient philosophy scholar, I'm interested in the demarcation between uh, natural objects and artifacts. And one particular case that is dear to me is the case of automatic machine. And the question of if and how they call into question the boundaries between nature and artificial uh, production. One idea that I studied is, is the idea in Aristotle that, I mean, the fantasy in Aristotle that we could imagine a world in which robots replaced uh, uh, lab, lab, labor work. This world for Aristotle is not even, I mean, it's, it's a fantasy, not even possible. It's perhaps count possible. Still Aristotle would insist that these robots are not living beings. 
and are not uh, human beings or animals. And my question is, why? Thank you. Thanks, Gabriel. Fantastic. Um, and lovely connections there between um, the um, the very kind of technological focus on the artificial um, and the more kind of um, classical considerations that um, those of us with a um, a technical education don't necessarily get taught very much. So it's lovely to hear. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is a, a, another colleague of mine, um, Steve Snow. Um, Steve is a research fellow here at the UQ's Center for Energy Data Innovation um, and also in the School of um, Architecture. His research focuses on users' relationships with their energy use and technology which can improve this relationship, including energy use visualizations. So we're now going to some very specific examples of um, the kind of things produced by technology and how they impact on people's everyday lives in interesting ways. Steve, yeah. over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so let's talk about disruptive technology. So my favourite disruptive technology is anything that creates energy data from people's homes. Now, Aussies love energy use data. At a barbecue, there's always going to be one dad talking to another dad about his solar panels. And one of them is going to say, without being asked, you know, Paul, yesterday I exported 24.7 kilowatt hours. And that was despite the fact that the AC was running full bore and the afternoon storm. Energy use data is gathered through an increasing number of avenues. Smart metering is now widespread in the UK. It's over 80%, over 85%, I think, and it's becoming uh, Southern Australia as well, where metering regulations state that all new electricity meters in homes must be smart enabled unless you opt out. Smart meters in the UK record data every 30 minutes and send this to the customer's electricity retailer, whereas Australian smart meters will soon record data every five minutes uh, which allows a slightly more insight into what's going on in people's homes, which can be quite a sensitive topic. So smart metered data is well regulated. There's plenty of customer protections through the, uh, I think it's the GDPR in, um, in the UK. In Australia, it's the consumer data right that is soon going to regulate how a person is able to share their electricity data. It is automatically shared with the retailer and consumers can opt to share that further if they wish, but this is quite a regulated process. Energy monitored data is slightly less so. Now, one in four Australian households have solar panels and most solar inverters give you really good high frequency data on your solar generation. There's been a huge growth in energy monitoring and it's becoming more affordable and more popular. Because in a time that everyone can trade shares, a, you know, a couple of clicks of an app. It's, it's bizarre that, that we only get a bill once a month for our energy. So in the future, there's gonna be a great number of really beneficial possibilities with energy use data. Companies will be able to analyze, <coughs> excuse me. Companies can analyze your energy data to alert you if you've left the oven on for three hours and this might stop a house fire. They can tell you if your hot water isn't heating when it should be. You can identify potential faults in appliances. Um, for instance, if you send appliance load signature information to the manufacturers, they're able to say, well, look, it's not working quite as it should. Can you send it in? Um, you can get notifications like your air conditioner is running full tilt on a day when it probably shouldn't be. Um, have, um, have you left a door open, for instance? So energy data also helps smart energy systems make decisions. For instance, if my consumption is high and the tariff is changing to peak, please let me know. Or if my consumption falls below a certain threshold, then, then charge the battery. So, so there's these incredibly useful uses of energy data um, that are possible, but we've also got to be a little bit careful. We've got to be careful because through analysis of energy data, um, and this wasn't even using machine learning. This is, this is just using some statistical inference. You can start to tell what time people wake up at night because there's nothing else on except maybe a fridge. And so if there's a small like, light globe that, that, that turns on, you can, you can tell when someone uses the bathroom. And if they use the bathroom a few times, maybe you might profile them for you know, a potential prostate problem. Maybe you're going to be marketing them some, some herbs or something like that. There's, there's a lot of potential inference that can be made about you 
but not only you, about the people who live with you. You can, you can profile sedentary behavior based on the television use in the microwave, if you know what wattage the microwave is. So, so there is a great deal of potential privacy issues in this space, as well as all of these really, you know, potentially fantastic things as well. So we have to make sure, my position is that we have to make sure that users are aware of this type of stuff to be careful what they're sharing. Do they need, does like, for instance, if you're sharing energy data, do you need to share your whole login? Maybe it's just a day's worth. We need to be um, a little bit careful, a bit like, like how on Facebook, you'll get things like um, saying like, oh, what was your first car? Tell us about your first car. Whereas really they're just trying to get at your secret information for passwords. So I'd like to leave you with, with two things to think about here. Um, the first is how do we get this mix right? Now it's, it's my position that energy use data can be incredibly helpful, like I said, stopping house fires, it's, it's necessary to enable people to make better decisions. It can um, assist with, with technology that improves your like energy efficiency, all of those things. But on the flip side, so how do we get the mix right? The second thing is permissions for sharing. So cookie notification, terms and conditions, these types of things are great for personal data, but energy use is interpersonal. There might be three adults in the one family. And so who is it who actually gets those types of notifications? Those, yeah, they're, they're questions I'd like to leave you, leave you with. This. So thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, on to our final panelist and, and, um, and kind of maintaining some of this focus on um, the kind of impacts of information technologies um, on, on people's lives. We have Jasim Hubbard. Jasim is a lecturer in information security at Royal Holloway University of London. And his main research focuses on cybersecurity topics, in particular, developing better cyber threat detection, as well as understanding human factors in cybersecurity. He also has an extensive background in computer graphics research, which links us right back to the first panelist. Um, Jasim, over to you. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Stephen. Um, so uh, these days, there seem to be a never-ending stream of disruptive, uh, of new disruptive concepts and technologies that promise to change the way we live our lives forever. Whether this be things like uh, self-driving cars, the metaverse. So the metaverse, for those of you who haven't heard, it's th this, this new concept that's looking at virtual reality devices connecting to this next generation of, of the internet, to um, um, uh, other, other things that you might have heard of include cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens that allow us to purchase scarce digital items and use di digital money, to um, other concepts like uh, Deep fakes, which shows us how digital humans can now be rendered at uh, a quality that is perceptually equivalent to real video. And for instance, uh, another emerging uh, topic is the topic of uh, uh, brain computer interfaces that have the long term promise of healing the blind, curing Alzheimer's, and perhaps even ma making better use of our, our brains and bodies. Now, all of these technologies bring uh, good and bad aspects about them, of, of course, for instance, um, and we have to sort of question a, a lot of these things. Um, can I really trust these disruptive technologies to keep me safe? Do I really want an internet where uh, I have digital assets that are as important as my real world assets? Um, Deep fakes, for instance, can be entertaining but um, we've seen how they can be used to create fake porn videos of real people. And this can cause significant reputational and psychological harm. Uh, we also see how cryptocurrencies uh, promises to decentralize the concept of money so that we no longer need to rely on banks to manage our money. But they are also notorious for being used by uh, cyber criminals who, who will encrypt your hard drive through ransomware and um, uh, those of uh, uh, several people do mining of bitcoins and the mining of bitcoins now uses more electricity than even small countries. This is quite bad for the environment, of course. Now, the, 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 the key thing that I want to communicate here is that it's important to note that disruptive technologies in of themselves are neither good or bad. It's really how we use them that matters. And so we, this means that we need to establish norms to determine what those good and bad use cases are of these technologies, some of which should perhaps be criminalized, 
uh, and others should perhaps be encouraged as they advance society as a whole. And so, but concepts with new and disruptive technologies often remain poorly understood though. And we need to be able to adapt them um, as a society re relatively quickly. Uh, those of you in the audience who are old enough to remember, uh, remember when email wasn't really a thing? Uh, remember when you didn't quite know whether to write an email as a formal letter each and every time you had to email a colleague? Um, and then remember when you had to first learn about phishing attacks and viruses and the things that you have to be concerned about uh, that came with the introduction of, of email. And so we've had to sort of learn all of these new concepts as a new and disruptive technology came around. And that, that trend isn't really gonna stop. Where as new things uh, happen, we're gonna have to adjust uh, all the time to these new uh, and disruptive technologies. And again, my key point here that I wanted to raise is the, are they good or bad? I'm saying that um, we have to think about them as the way we use them can be good or bad, not necessarily that in of themselves, they are good or bad. So my research interests lie in making well-informed decisions about technologies and their uses. Um, whether this be through data visualization, big data analytics, machine learning to perhaps even automate some of these decision-making, um, or understand how people and technologies depend on each other in order to predict behavioral relationships and dependencies. My bread and butter is in improving network defenses. But in more recent years, I've expanded my research to look at, for instance, uh, detecting security violations of, um, uh, of AI systems, detecting GDPR violations when companies share your personal data between themselves, uh, detecting social harms from attacks on virtual reality systems, uh, detecting deep fakes and trying to understand the harms that they might cause. Um, all of this so we can make more um, well-informed decisions as device owners, as uh, technical analysts, as risk owners, as business decision makers, and just as individuals of, uh, individual members of society. I think the future holds a lot of promise. We just need to make sure that the direction we take these technologies align with societal benefits and not be to the detriment of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you for all our panelists for your, for your statements. Um, some, I hope you'll all agree, very uh, fascinating set of, of different takes on the space that we're in. So we're into our kind of um, open questions and discussion part of the panel now. Um, thanks, Paul. We've already got a question from you in, into the chat. Um, uh, for, for everyone else, um, if people would like to um, ask the questions themselves, if you make use of the raise a hand function that's in the reactions button at the bottom, bottom of your screen, pop up your hand and we'll be able to um, go to you in turn um, with questions. Um, but to kick us off, because we got Paul's question there in the chat, uh, Paul, I don't know if you want to quickly put your camera on and ask, or if you can just rely on um, everyone having read it already, um, or if there's anything you want to add. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, Stephen. Um, Really interesting um, presentations, panel panel members. Thank you for that. Um, and and several of you touched upon my my question, and that is basically. And I'm really thinking about algorithms that are now linked with big data and are going to make an enormous amount of decisions for us, based on an, an amount of information that we as humans can never phantom, you know, to have that had that all together. As a result of that, you know, a lot of developments are happening in our society and people feel lost and people feel um, worried about the technology. And what you see is what I call a disruption of people's mind, you know, that uh, the, so part of the social unrest that we now see, uh, you know, I would think has to do that people feel lost, that people don't know what their position is. Technology has a role to play in that. And my question is, uh, how do we at, how do we better uh, take everybody with us, not just the twenty percent of people? And actually, if you talk about AI, it's less than one percent of the people who understand what they are doing. So you know, how are we going to take the, the rest of the population with us without creating this enormous social disruption that we see happening? You know, also with the social media and things like that. Thank you. Who'd like to go first?
Oh, I can jump in. <laughs> so, so I think, I mean, it's a, it's a terrific question. It's a big question. I think we're all going to have to become a great deal more comfortable with, with machines making decisions on our behalf. There was a study of a prototype system that made decisions for people about their energy use and it was um and it was about scheduling the laundry so so it was like what um time of use tariffs you've got expensive electricity at this time cheaper electricity it goes up and down based on the spot market you can't possibly keep up with that so we've developed a little prototype that will do the laundry at times that it good for you so so you, you get the clothes ready for the kids in time but it's also going to save you money and the findings from that study were that people were very happy to delegate that to an AI machine because it was something that they trusted. And I think that the trust is absolutely vital here in that there was, there was a lot going on behind the scenes and they were able to lift the, the bonnet on it if, um, if, if they wanted to, but the majority of people didn't. And that they were just happy that this thing, um, once it had given proven performance, it built the trust and then the trust was necessary in order to enable people to keep using it. So I think trust here is, is a really important thing. In total agreement uh, with that, Steve, absolutely. But we also see at the same time that we are losing trust left, right and center. Yeah. So, you know, that becomes a, a, a difficult sort of uh, difficult sort of scenario on how are we building trust back? Yeah so that we can utilize the technology because there's so many fantastic aspects as you already mentioned yeah and, and others as well but you know if we lose the trust then uh you know that's the end of it and as you some some others are saying you know you can fake videos you can fake news you know we see the disruption that's doing internationally so it's people are becoming less trustful rather than more trustful so we 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 having a huge problem in any case, in the in the foreseeable future, in, in having the trust, yeah, getting the trust. So this is one of those spaces where maybe not um, uh, my my everyday um, understanding of um, technological developments and and how society responds to to them um, might well inform some of what we're looking at now with modern technologies um, and. My own personal uh, knowledge goes back to kind of industrial revolution and and kind of um, uh, the 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 measures that people took to disrupt new technologies because it was about kind of disrupting their life as they knew it. We could argue as to whether um, things were actually improved or not as a result of the technologies that were introduced. Um, but there's something interesting there about um, how um, what lessons can we draw from the past um, with other um, technologies that were equally disruptive at the time. There's something that, interesting about the pace and the scale of things happening now. Um, but is there something there that we can, can draw on um, more constructively uh, to inform the people who are actually doing the disruption now um, in the startups, in the, you know, in Silicon Valley and so on? I guess I'm looking at you, Gabrielle, here a little bit. But... Well, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, there are lessons to be learned in the sense that I don't think that the speed at which technology advances today, I mean, the mere speed uh, makes a conceptual difference. I mean, in the ancient world as well, this technology could be very disruptive. I mean, I'm thinking about even um, very simple technological advancements like, like writing, for instance. I mean, the, we are all used to writing, but, but, but writing... Was, was a particularly disrupting, in some sense, invention. So my, my impression is that perhaps in the ancient world, issues around trust that are so prominent today were not the, the main thing. The main thing was to create responses that could uh, facilitate um, the functioning of the society, remembering, obviously, uh, that the difference be differences between classes in the ancient world was were even sharper than they are, they, they are today. So we are th thinking uh, here about elite in many in many in many ways, but I don't think that conceptually challenges were uh, so 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 different. So in a way, the pace is different, but not the the challenge in itself. So that's my my take on that. 
Thanks. And, and apologies to Paul Henman in, in, the, in the chat, but I, I kind of almost ran rush out of your, your question there a little bit there in terms of looking at how examining social dynamics um, with new technologies in the past might provide insights into contemporary uh, technologies, but it's a very similar point, but taking a, a kind of a, 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 a sociological rather than a historical perspective on this. Um, uh, Paul, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to this. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that the, and somebody Sorry. already, you know, I think you had this, one comment, one comment. I think the issue is human, coming back to the previous question, but you wanted to talk to Kate, I think. Uh, sorry, I just realized that um, I was talking to a different Paul and you heard me talking to you then. Uh, oh, Paul okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm nice, Stephen. I'm happy to hand it over to the panel. I guess that uh, it's great to have Gabrielle's comment. Um, I think there's also other people's comments about technologies of five, 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago. It could also be interested, interested in people's thoughts about that. Yeah. I guess I could sort of jump in here a little bit, even um, with, in terms of um, making, I teach Latin at UQ, um, Latin accessible because um, most, most of our students don't come to UQ to learn Latin with a high school background. So there's, there's actually, you know, a school class social distinction here that goes back years ago where a certain class of people would do Latin. Now it is accessible to everybody and um, I have developed some um, technologies that help students and um, it does make it accessible to all. It can be misused. So if people don't actually do the work themselves, it's possible to misuse the technology. Um, so that's one point I think that's really important is that something that's um, designed to assist somebody can still be used in the wrong way, which is a theme I think we've seen through um, quite a few things here. But what was quite striking um, when I was developing this, and I showed it to some of our alumni who had taught Latin and studied Latin, they found it quite confronting and thought that um, it added um, confronting in, in a couple of ways. Um, one of the one of which was that they thought it um, was going to um, create another layer of um, complexity. Um, because it was, a, they had to learn how to use a program or learn how to um, to work with a technology. Um, so there are really interesting things we can see even with with simple tasks such as trying to learn Latin with introducing new technologies. They also use color too, and they thought that was just um, quite unbelievable. But when they actually got to use it, they went, "Oh, this is an, an extra layer of learning. Oh, we can see how this is going to assist." So there are really interesting, um, I think, sociological developments that can be viewed positively and negatively um, in all this. And I think that goes back to the whole concept of language learning that we just um, heard for Gabrielle as well. So. Um, does that help in, in any way? Yes, thanks, Janet. Um, Mashuda, Jess, did you have anything that you wish to add? I was just going to um, pick up on um, part of Paul's question um, in terms of like, you know, um, how might the, um, how do we think examining social dynamics with new technologies in the past might provide insights into our contemporary new technologies? and. And it's interesting that um, we think in the recent past of the introduction of the smartphone and how that has changed people's social behavior in the real world, right? You know, you see people having dinner um, in restaurants and instead of having a conversation, they're busy um, with their mobile phones, checking their mobile phones. Going back a little bit further into the past, you have a similar phenomena with, you know, um, with um, TVs, you know, as soon as TV sets became commonplace in the home, right, it changed the social dynamics of, you know, how people interacted in their spaces in their homes as well. You know, after dinner, people would sit down and watch the TV and we'd be glued to the TV. They'd be talking about afterwards about what they saw on TV. Similarly, people might talk afterwards about what they've been doing on their phone. But there is something inherent about how we interact between us changes um, over time as a technology we develop changes. And I think we need to be a little bit cognizant of that and, and 
um, see whether or not that's causing harm or if it's causing good or if it's even both. Um, I, I think uh, going back to Paul's, uh, the first Paul's question of uh, does technology disrupt our, our thoughts and how people can take uh, and how we can take the people with us on this road. I think there's a, there's a, a couple of things to, to, to think about here. One is that people, some people will hop on any new type of technology, left, right, and center, right? Whereas some people will be a bit apprehensive, whether this is because they are perhaps on the more cybersecurity side and a bit more paranoid uh, about new things, um, or they just, um, they just uh, don't really want to, to follow up on the latest threat, uh, trends. So this could be uh, attributed to things like demographics, right? So kids and teens will tend to join the th stuff what's cool, whereas the older generation might be reluctant to to learn new things because it's it's not something that they're used to. One thing I wanted to highlight is this notion of uh, in the academic literature, there's something that's referred to as the privacy paradox. I would kind of think of it as like a, a compromise in many in many ways, and this is the idea that a lot of people will say that they value privacy but will still go out of their way to install the latest apps and uh, hopping, on, um, hopping on the latest trends, no matter what they are doing. And so we have this interesting discrepancy in terms of what people say that they want and how they actually behave. And this is something that's, uh, that occurs again and again and again with new and uh, disruptive technologies, as well as new cool things that are popping up, whether it's latest social media, or uh, anything, and so the the answer to, to to addressing that isn't really the concept of like uh, awareness, like making people aware of their behavior, but it's actually uh, it's it's much more it's deeper than that. It's not just about um, uh, education and and the awareness. It's it's also about them making the conscious decisions and changing their habits and changing and making people aware of the things that they're doing, not just educating them about that these issues are happening in the first place. So, uh, yeah. But like, it's also, I'd, I'd say, um, part of the responsibility is the technology designers in the first place, because there's this- Absolutely. There's Absolutely. this really nice paper, which, which says the privacy, like the concept of privacy literacy is flawed in that we we shouldn't be placing the onus of um proof onto people or like we shouldn't be making people responsible it's, it's your fault you got sucked into that phishing scam um that these types of things need to be designed in and 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 that we shouldn't be placing that onus on people yeah i agree okay i think we've got just about time to squeeze one more question and we have one from katie in the chat which is an interesting one around how we actually approach um, uh, teaching aspects of um, computational technologies. Katie. Yeah, it's actually computational thinking I'm, I'm looking at. Um, and I've seen it's come out in the new edition of the Australian Curriculum for Mathematics, which means kids from you know four or five years old all the way through 18, 19 um, will be studying that in school. But I think that the politicians have a sense that it's about teaching kids how to think like a computer um, so that they can work with machine learning. But, but what I understand about it is it's more about understanding human thinking um, and how we can kind of work in partnership with, uh, with technology. And I'm wondering, um, be, I'm starting tomorrow my new class with secondary uh, pre-service mathematics teachers. And I'd love to be able to share with them a little bit about examples you might have in your fields around the kind of computational thinking where you're having to to really learn about human thinking in order to be able to work effectively with technologies. Okay, we will have to keep this brief because the, this will get us shut down um, as we go back into the other um, uh, session. But um, pa panelists, if you have anything quick that you'd like to, to share, share with us on that. I have a quick one, um, just um, interface design. Designing interfaces, we have to think about how people work. So we have to think about how they think in order to design interfaces for them. Um, I have another point. So in cybersecurity, 
um, there's this uh, interesting issue of um, the idea of usability of something is in direct competition with, um, with the security of something. So the second you add new features of something, it means that uh, you're increasing the attack surface of something. So in order for us to understand how people should use systems better, one of the things you have to think about is the human factors. What are the human factors involved? How are people using the systems? And how can we make them both usable but still keep them secure? And that also includes looking at how people are using uh, these systems when it comes to um, making sure that they are uh, secure whenever they use these technologies. A really quick one from me is, it, is computational thinking, now that computers are that complex, we don't, we're not the ones programming the ones and the zeros. That, that programs like Scratch and stuff are teaching you the logic to be able to interact with a computer at a level that is much more accessible for most people. And that's the level that, that most people are interacting. And so I see computational thinking as incredibly um, important at being able to program a computer, but in a way that is incredibly accessible by a range of people, if that makes sense. Thanks. I think at that point, I'm going to have to, to cut things off. Um, and thanks to Andrew and Paul for your comments in the chat. Um, uh, it's nice to end on a, on a constructive, uh, practical note. Well, I hope that those of you over in digital health and society had close to as good a conversation as we did in our disruptive technology session. My FOMO lasted about two seconds. Um, and we just had a terrific, terrific discussion about all, all manner of things. And I hope that that was true for the other breakout room as well. Welcome back. We'll now be hearing from Professor Janet Wiles from UQ's School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. Professor Wiles will give a demonstration and a presentation of Rockatoo, a social robotic bird inspired by Cape York Peninsula's highly intelligent but elusive palm cockatoo, renowned for its unique way of communicating through drumming. I've been excited about this for days. I can't wait to see it. Welcome, Professor Wiles. Okay, so thank you, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here. So this is a story of art meets science, of street art and augmented reality. And if you'd like to try the Rockatoo app for yourself in a moment, there's a QR code on the screen. Point your phone at the code and you can be downloading the Rockatoo app while you listen. The QR code will also appear in the Zoom chat uh, if all goes well. Okay, so where did this start? A year ago. Okay, a year ago. Um, the Brisbane Street Art Festival and the Queensland Artificial Intelligence Hub challenged two young artists, Scott Nagy and Crimson, to visualize the work of a UQ scientist, to visualize AI. Street art, I don't know if you know about this, but street art starts with a wall and a location. Their location was a busy shopping center. Um, it was a busy shopping centre where the escalators enter. So moving walkways, children, families, shopping trolleys, 35,000 visitors on a weekend. Scott and Jan chose to paint the moment when a young roboticist first meets her social robot. They're both conservationists as well as artists and they chose to make her robot a palm cockatoo. Now, the reason for this choice was these birds have a unique ability. They communicate by drumming on hollow trees using drumsticks, which they fashion for themselves. So uh, this is an AI project. You know, how could we resist adding augmented reality? So UQ and the Queensland AI Hub teamed up with Audacious, which is a local augmented reality company, to create the Rockatoo app. When you point the app at the mural, it animates the bird, which then flies out of your screen, and comes and lands in front and starts to drum using a pencil which uh, installed from the mural. Okay, where it lands depends on where you are and how close your phone is to the screen. 
If you're at the mural, as you can see in this image here, it lands in front. So we launched phase one of the app at Australia's National Science Week last year with a couple of hundred children and their parents. We set up for a day near the mural uh, and so that children could take a photo with the augmented reality bird, we created a media wall, which is a two by three metre backdrop of the Rocker 2 mural. Uh, and then children got to talk to the scientists afterwards. Okay, so this is a short clip from the launch. This is on YouTube. Okay, um, so you can see in these panels, people posing with this virtual bird, getting their photos taken with a virtual creature. And then for the panel on the right, uh, you can see Dr. Christina Zdenek, who she's the biologist who actually made the audio recordings of the bird. And she's actually holding, I don't know if you can see it, a real palm cockatoo drumming stick. So the video's online if you're interested in seeing more of uh, what went on that day. But that's the background. Um, let's see if the app works for you. So if you've downloaded the app to your phone, you'll see a series of links. If you click on begin and wait while it loads, it takes about five seconds to load. When you see the scan neural, point your phone at the image on my screen. And uh, I should say, if it does work for you, um, please drop a message in the Zoom chat telling us where the bird lands when it flies back to you. You can also move your phone around and see what happens. Now, I know that not everybody has the app on their phone. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what people with a phone are actually seeing at the moment. Um, when you tap the screen, yellow sticky notes appear with uh, instructions and information. If you keep tapping the screen, different post-it notes appear. So one of them is, you know, turn on sound and you'll hear the bird calls and the drumming. But if you do this, please mute yourself on Zoom, otherwise we'll hear this cough and your sound. The app itself is was not just about entertainment. Augmented reality merges the online and the real worlds. And to me, this is one of the defining features of who we are today and who we are becoming. When we created the experience, we wanted children to imagine what a social robot could be and also to see a name that they have chosen themselves up there on the wall as post-it notes. So the yellow sticky note here shows that someone's dream social robot is a green winged macaw and they would call it Skeets. If you're using the app, you can actually try this out. Um, if you click on the link, your robot, it'll take you to a Google form where you can enter an animal and a name. Um, just a quick warning, there is a, a time delay before the robot name gets posted onto the wall uh, because we do ensure that all entries are family friendly. And today uh, we actually have Catherine in, the, Catherine in the background who's checking these and posting through the URL as fast as possible. So you might see your um, name come up in a few minutes. Okay, so to sum up, the app is a very simple demonstration of how anyone without a bit of a technology can reach into the online world and then see it reflected back into the real world. All right, lastly, if you click on the with thanks, you can go down a whole lot of different rabbit holes. Um, the app has links to the online worlds of the artists to the scientists and to the social robots. So interestingly, Rocker 2 was inspired by, of all things, um, a rat-sized robot, which is called iRat. Uh, it was designed by my group at the University of Queensland and it's used at UC San Diego for social neuroscience. So the iRat is a social companion for a rat and it gave the artists the idea of a social robot being an animal rather than a humanoid robot. 
So our group does actually uh, design humanoid robots for children's classrooms as well. One of our latest STEM projects is called Animates, run by Sarah Matthews. Children design their own animated puppets with microcontrollers and they tell stories. This year, we're adding language to the puppet construction kits. So why add language to a STEM project? Speech recognition is one of the most fundamental AI capabilities, but it's only available for about 200 of the world's 7,000 languages. At UQ, together with the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language, which actually has collaborators right across the UK, um, we're working on speech recognition for Indigenous languages. And in the Animate uh, project, our long range vision is to enable every child to use their own language with their STEM puppets. So AI is all around us, but it can be hard to understand it beyond movie stereotypes. And the point of the Visualizing AI project is to unlock people's imaginations about AI through street art. I'm also hoping that The Rocker 2 might inspire a new generation of social roboticists. If you're in Brisbane or you're visiting, the mural is at Mount Gravatt, which is just 20 minutes away from the Social Robotics Lab at UQ. The Palm Cockatoos are also in Queensland, which is a mere 2,600 kilometres north for a short 30-hour uh, drive. Um, have fun playing with the app. All my contact details are here on the screen. And please reach out by email or through the Zoom chat if you'd like to give us some feedback or to get in touch. That is astonishing. I was just waiting, I'm sorry, I was just waiting for my um, palm cockatoo to leave me alone, <laughs> which is a little bit lonelier than I was when she was right here on my screen. That is an incredible project and I hope you saw some of the love for you in the, in the chat because um, I know that people also really appreciate that project. It's just incredible how interactive AI can be and that when we think about intrusiveness and, and all of that, we, it's important to remember the other side of it, right? Which can be about knowledge generation and learning, you know, through, I don't know, this, is, this will sound corny maybe, but, you know, through love and the beautiful ways that we can learn more about the world that it's also our responsibility to protect. So thank you for that very much. Uh, we've included further information regarding Rocka2 on the event website. If you want to explore it further, there was that last slide that had information about getting in touch and reproduce some of the ways to get in touch with the project team if you'd like to. So do check that out. This brings us to the end of part A. And in keeping with our digital fluidity, I'll remind you that part B is going to um, take place over in YouTube. So give you a couple of instructions about that. But before we get to that, um, let me give a big thank you to all of our speakers today. It's been an incredibly rich couple of hours. And thank you, and by the speakers, I mean the people who made formal presentations, but also an attentive audience who joined into all of the breakout rooms and I know gave all of the speakers something to think about and new ways of creating community in what is itself a digital environment and by participating in that way, you make it a digitally enabling environment. So my thanks to all of you for a really um, rich and stimulating couple of hours. Please do rejoin us for part B, a bit of a preview. Part B will include a keynote presentation by Professor Steve Benford, who is a professor of computing science from the University of Nottingham. And we'll also have a great debate where leading experts from around the world will argue whether digitization is reshaping humanities. Humanity, that was my disciplinary bias showing through for a second there, sorry, humanity in general, uh, whether digitization is reshaping humanity for the better. So part B will be hosted on YouTube. The link has been provided to you via email, but you can also find it down in the chat right now. I believe it's popped up in the chat uh, just right now. And there is an intermission during which I invite you to enjoy digital opera from one of our PhD, one of UQ's PhD candidates, uh, Ms. Tana Rose. She's an incredibly talented opera singer. And I encourage you very much to, um, to have a listen during the intermission. And we will see you over in YouTube for part B.
Thanks very much and see you soon.
welcome everyone to part B of the UQ UK Government's Science and Innovation Network Digital Society virtual event. I hope you all enjoyed the intermission digital opera by UQ's PhD can candidate, Ms. Tana Rose. For those of you in the UK or Europe, I'm sure it was a beautiful way to start your morning. I now have the pleasure of introducing the keynote presentation for today's event. Professor Stephen Benford has an extensive resume. He is the Dunford Professor of Computer Science at the University of Nottingham, where he co-founded the Mixed Reality Laboratory. He's director of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, funded Horizon Center for Doctoral Training, and director of the university's Smart Products Beacon of Research Excellence. Stephen Benford will give an insight into his collaborations with artists to create, tour, and study interactive artworks for over 25 years. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. I'll just uh, get this screen sharing business going. And then I hope we're going to be looking Goodish. So um, yeah, hopefully you'll all um, scream at some point if you can't see uh, the images and or hear the videos when I play them. So yes, it's great to be thinking about our future digital selves. I think many people now are familiar with the idea that we have digital selves, that we construct and curate digital identities. But I think we mostly see them as things that we project out of ourselves into the internet and onto social media. And in this talk, I'd like to take a very different view. I'd like to turn it around and look inwards. I'd like to look at our individual bodies, our minds and our emotions, because I think that's the next frontier for digital technologies and it's going to transform the self. Technologies such as effective computing try to measure your emotions. Technologies such as brain computer interfaces deal with your brain activity, possibly your thoughts. Robotics, prosthetics, orthotics, implants are increasingly integrated with your body. I'm going to come at this from a particular direction, and that is to use interactive art as a mirror with which to look at ourselves. I've been working with artists for more than 30 years to create and tour and study interactive artworks. And I do this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think that entertainment, culture and art are vitally important aspects of life and the economy that deserve attention from technology developers. But also I'm aware that artists are creative and provocative. They often give people, including the public, experiences um, that can transform how they see digital technologies. So we're going to follow one particular artist through a series of projects. I'll drill down on just one person and look at some new perspectives some reflections on our future digital selves. The artist here is pictured center of the image. It's Brendan Walker. Uh, he describes himself as a thrill engineer. Uh, throughout his career, Brendan has been looking to understand, but also create thrilling experiences using digital technologies. The first project we did with Brendan was called Thrill Laboratory. And he said, I want to create a personal telemetry system for roller coasters. So when people go on a coaster, data about their emotional experience, their thrill will be captured. So we built, a, you can see it here, a helmet with a camera that was always looking at your face and microphones that were listening to what you said, heart rate monitors that were uh, measuring your possible anxiety and sweat monitors too, and some other sensors that looked at key facial muscles associated with smiling and frowning. And we measured your accelerations and all sorts of stuff. And we captured this data. What Brendan did with the data was he immediately showed it back to the riders. He would either give them their data souvenirs or he would project it onto screens for audiences to see and he would have experts to discuss it. 
And what I've got here is a very rough video clip. I apologize for the quality. It was kind of captured quickly at the first ever outing of Thrilled Laboratory, just to give you a sense of what it was like. enough she just screams for the rest of the ride we, we don't need to hear the rest uh, you get the picture so what was brendan doing the the interesting twist was this idea of showing people back their data and it, it was a provocation to storytelling whatever you showed people it could be very ambiguous heart rate data from which you can actually tell relatively little people would immediately start discussing their emotional experiences and sharing them and reflecting them. And there would be a rich dialogue about the nature of fear and suspense. And so, although that's a really simple thing, it immediately raises one question about our future digital selves. Will computers tell us what we feel? And that's what I sometimes feel that effective computing is trying to do. And it tries to tell us what we feel with a very narrow palette of emotions, boiling it down to just a basic subset? Or will computers help us better understand and discuss and interpret our feelings? So that's question number one. Okay, now we wanted to go a step further and make our own interactive rides in which your data would actually somehow control the ride. And unfortunately, the UK funding councils, stingy as they are, wouldn't let us build a roller coaster. So we had to settle for something quite a bit smaller. We bought a rodeo bull. I don't know if you've ridden one of these at a party, but you sit atop and a human operator usually moves the controls in an attempt to throw you off. Well, we made a rodeo bull called the Bronchomatic. And the difference here was that it was partially controlled by your breathing. You can see the person in the picture is wearing a chest strap monitor that roughly senses their breathing. The more they breathe, the more the bronco bucks. The harder it is to stay on, the more it pushes back at them, the more they breathe. At the same time, we tell them that to score points, they have to breathe a lot. So it's a crazy game. They're set up with this dilemma about managing their own uh, breathing on this robotic ride. And again, just a quick video to give you a sense of, of kind of what it's like. So we studied how people experienced this ride as we toured it, we looked at their breathing data, we interviewed them, we observed them. And they had a number of interesting strategies for trying to control the experience. Some people tried to control their own bodies and through this control the ride. They said, we know how to control our breathing. We've learned this through martial arts and shooting or yoga. And we think that if we can only control ourselves, we can control the technology. 
Some people instantly forgot about the whole business of breathing and they just clung on with their arms and their legs as you normally do and hung on for dear life. A very common strategy and actually the one that I think led to the most powerful experience was the natural temptation to hold your breath whenever the ride kicks up to the next level. You feel it moving a bit more and you, you can't resist going <gasps> to try and just keep it under control. And then you sit there and then you realize you're running out of breath. And then you realize you're going to have to breathe. And then you realize that when you do, you're gonna breathe deeply and the ride is going to kick off to an entirely new level. And that 30 seconds of sitting on top of this robot reflecting on your own lack of control over yourself, I think was quite a profound moment of suspense for many people who rode this. Okay, the bronchomatic seems in many ways, perhaps a kind of fairly trivial experience, but actually what's going on is it's an example of human robot interaction. And the world at the moment is very bothered about autonomous systems, vehicles, service robots, healthcare robots, you name it, that our bodies are increasingly coming into contact with actuated digital technologies. And what Brendan's example shows us is the challenges of contesting control and autonomy with such machines. And we broke this down. I don't think we've got much time for the detail here, but we broke down, if you like, the challenge of the Bronco into two dimensions. We said, on the one hand, people are surrendering control. Sometimes they have voluntary control over this thing, but at other times it's involuntary. And the thing here is it's not just control of the Bronco, it's control of their own bodies, because your breathing is only partially under your, your own control. I'm doing a good job of controlling it as I speak to you now, but I can't stop breathing for more than about 90 seconds before my autonomic system takes over. So our physical bodies are not the same as our cognitive selves and we can't fully control them. And then there's this question of awareness of control. Do I even know what's going on? Am I aware of the battle that I'm engaged in? So very quickly, this is the holding your breath journey through the Bronco. You start off aware of what's going on and broadly in control. You have this, there's this little dip, this moment of profound insight for some people where you become aware of your lack of control and then you fly off. This is the strategy of hanging on for dear life. You very quickly become unaware of what's going on. Uh, and then sooner or later, again, it all becomes involuntary. Everybody ends up in the top right that's the way the Bronco works, but people take very different emotional journeys through control to get there. So what's the question for your debate? What's the Bronco got to do with these other technologies? Well, I think it's quite simple. Being a digital self implies autonomy. I think that's in part what a self is, an autonomous self. People talk about autonomous systems. They talk about systems having autonomy. But where will human autonomy lie in this? How will digital technologies perturb our ability to control ourselves as well as the technology? And I think in a simple but challenging way, Brendan's experience illuminates that question. One final question, and then we will, uh, I appreciate time's ticking on. So this is one final work from Brendan. Again, the aim was to create another ride. This ride takes an everyday playground swing and it turns it into a, a thrilling set of amusement rides. You wear a VR headset, we track how much you're swinging and that drives your motion in a virtual world. So as you're physically swinging, you're moving through this crazy virtual city. And you can choose one of four different rides to have a go at. So again, let's take a look at the video of VR Playground. So the first ride, each time you swing back, you just accelerate 
forward a bit more in the virtual world. So this is about a feeling of speed and acceleration. When, you when, when it goes black, it's second ride you're underwater and you're essentially a, a jellyfish or maybe you're riding on a jellyfish I was never sure each time you swing physically you pump up in the air a little bit or the water a little bit more it's a vertigo ride I ride oh I feel like a jellyfish <laughs> third ride's a bit more zany. You're jumping between the rooftops, buildings in the city. Each time you swing, you jump from one roof to the next. And last up, Walker, a hardcore ride. This one really is a tricky one. You're in the belly of a giant robot that's walking through the city. You've got some nasty, twisty motions going on. So we spent a long time analysing what was going on here. and. Um, the most surprising thing is it works. The number of people when you present them with the idea say, that's terrible, people are going to be instantly sick. Everyone knows that's the problem with VR. Um, and as the slide suggests, you know, people have got very different tolerances for rides. That's generally true at a theme park anyway. And the feedback and the observations are that, you know, most people can find one or more of the rides that work for them. What's the wider point here is, about something we would call sensory misalignment. What's going on in VR Playground is your body and mind are getting a whole bunch of sensory information. And Brendan is interfering with some of that. And he does it in a way that it doesn't line up perfectly. And this puts you in a, an unusual experience space. Now, most of the world thinks that the senses should be aligned. In everyday life, it seems kind of like a weird thing thing if your senses aren't aligned. People who are developing virtual reality are spending gazillions on trying to build force feedback devices that perfectly align what you touch with what you see with what you hear. Everyone thinks that's how it should work. Brendan says, well, no, actually, if you fool people's senses, you can create very powerful illusions, in this case of thrill and speed and acceleration. Out of interest, if you look at the research literature, there are some examples of something that sits in the middle where you can misalign people's senses and change their behavior without them being aware of it. If I put you in a virtual world and I show you a straight path, it's sort of infinitely long and I tell you to walk along it. And then every now and then I change the angle of the world in your headset by just a degree or so, so small that you don't notice you will follow it and I can make you walk in a circle in my lab, but you will think you're walking in a straight line. This is called redirected walking. And there's a whole bunch of other sort of psychological tricks that you can kind of carry out to change people's experience of the world. So what's the question? Well, I've phrased it a bit negatively here and I, I wish I could have found a kind of more balanced phrasing for can we trust augmented sensory experiences? By augmenting or manipulating some senses and carefully juxtaposing them with others, we can clearly give people powerful experiences. And yet at the same time, they may not be aware of what we're doing. 
And that raises a whole bunch of questions, again, about the nature of the self. If we can't trust our senses uh, at a bodily and cognitive level, then what's the nature of the self? So, okay, I think it's probably time for me to wrap up and take some questions. We've kind of followed the work of just one particular artist, and there are many other artists who are doing great work with body technologies, AI, you name it. And very often those works rain, raise profound questions when you start to think about them. Brendan's work for us as researchers, at least, you know, has raised three, we think, quite deep questions about our future digital selves. One of the reasons, uh, one, we've come to characterize a lot of what goes on with this interactive art as being about uncomfortable interactions. Brendan in particular, by exploring thrill as a sensation, takes people to a space that isn't always comfortable. And that is the nature of the theme park, the thrill ride, uh, the horror film, when we engage with them. And we do those things in part to be entertained, but sometimes to be enlightened as well. There is a long history of people engaging with discomfort as part of religious practices or rituals or all sorts of things. So I think one of the things that interactive art does as a mirror is it cautiously and hopefully ethically uses discomfort to confront us with questions about our future digital selves. Thank you. If you'd like to know more, there's also a book that describes a good number of these examples and uh, you're very welcome to buy a copy from some local online bookstore. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take questions, thank you. That was just terrific. Am I off, am I off mute now too? You are. Okay, good, good, good. And I might get things going. I know that we have a complicated thing across a couple of platforms and Rachel is translating from YouTube into the chat here. But just, you were, you know, you were leaning into this a little bit at the end of this talk. Steve, and though the experiments that you're doing actually put me to mind of some of the work that Christian Knoll uh, used to do around cities. And what he used to do is he used to strap people up with much less, much, your, your machines are fancier, I will say that. <laughs> fancier. So this was an earlier moment, but he used to put um, sensory devices on people and send them into cities. And the goal of doing this was to try to understand uh, where cities were exciting and where cities had dead zones. And what was, what was great, so he would then map, there was, it was early sort of geo-mapping of city spaces. And what was great about these experiments is that over sending out a number of people, it was quite easy to map the dead zones in a city, the parts of the city that elicited no responses from a range of people who were kitted out with, the, with these you know, sensory devices. But what was not so clear was what to make, how to interpret the parts of the city that elicited a response. So for instance, you could have a space that elicited, you could see heart rates spiked, breathing became faster, but it wasn't clear whether that was a, an excited response or a fearful response. And so you were leaning into this a little bit at the end by talking about whether there's, and I feel my experience of a roller coaster is extremely similar. I'd be the person you'd mute the entire time because it would be nothing but screaming. And then I get off and say, it was, a, it was amazing because the experience of scaring yourself is a pleasurable experience. And I just, I wonder about the, 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 the kind of inherent confusion in those, in those categories and how you think through that in this, in this work. Christian Knowles' work is fantastic. I would encourage anyone to, to look it up. And, and part of what he did was this real ambiguity of taking this fuzzy data and crystallizing it by printing it out on an ordnance survey map of a town in the UK, which made it look like hard scientific data. Um, and yet it was really open to interpretation. And that was really a lot of what I was trying to say in the first point was that, you know, some of the things that worry me about effective computing and machine learning in relation to emotions isn't that it isn't possible to determine something about someone's emotional state from an algorithm or even useful but it just reduces the palette it tries to reduce the ambiguity and the palette of our emotional experience to something very small at least as it's done today whereas emotion is about ambiguity and debate mm -hmm. and interpretation and reflection and every time you reflect you change what you thought before 
So yeah, my call is for work like Christians that because it's so super ambiguous, actually opens up the space of emotional discussion as a, as a human being. Exactly, and, and for all kinds of things about how we actually inhabit that, space, because that's also a gendered experience, potentially it's an experience about age, right? At different times in one's life, one feels, you know, stairs are scarier to me at this age than they were 20 years ago. I'm just gonna come out and say that. So yeah, exactly, that's really, okay. I have a question here from Katie um, Macker. She writes this, she says, I'm curious about the early example with the bucking machine. What was the outcome of those who were trained to control their breath? It says something about training and how we exercise control. Um, so, I mean, the outcome for everybody was you fall off the Bronco. And, and I mean, you want to, you, you don't want to be on there for longer than two minutes. It then becomes an unpleasant experience. Um, so at an individual level, everybody loses. Um, the question is, what do you experience along the way? And what do you end up reflecting on? I, I can't say whether people who, who did try breath control lasted longer than the others. I feel I ought to be able to look that up, but I can't remember the answer. Um, we possibly weren't so, if you like, so bothered about who wins. So, so I guess my point was, I think, you know, I think the outcome for people where it really works is, is a, a reflection or an understanding about your lack of control over yourself and the world. I'm not saying everybody reached that conclusion, by the way. Some people just rode the Bronco and enjoyed it, but I think that's the, the message. And I think people who know how to control their own breathing have probably already got a deeper insight into that because I suspect they've spent more time thinking about the challenges of regulating yourself. Yeah, and then the question is, you know, mm. what happens mm. when that comes up against technology? How does technology help us regulate ourselves or otherwise? Mm. Uh, David McCready is fascinated by the swing piece and the opportunities to trial this at the local park. <laughs> he wants to know if he can download it. So, me too, me too, I've got an Oculus Rift. Can we, can we download this somewhere? So, so Brendan, um, his company, Studio GoGo, -Go, I believe they're called, um, certainly does uh, now tour this work. I mean, we, we toured it as a research project for, for quite a long time, and I think it's certainly now gone commercial. I believe they were thinking of producing a downloadable version, but honestly don't know where they are with that. So the company is uh, so yeah, Studio GoGo, -Go, Brendan Walker. Um, it, it may be available. There was certainly, we did a... Um, we did produce a version on the Gear VR that you could train to work on pretty much any swing. So it's certainly possible. Studio GoGo? -Go? Yeah. Good, good to know. Can I, can I ask a question about the metaverse? <laughs> yes, please do. I think, because I think you, didn't you just recently write a piece in the conversation about the metaverse? I, I did, yes. We spent- Who owns um, it? How, how afraid should we be? <laughs> Is what? it coming for us? Should I cancel my Facebook account? Um, well, you know, a, that, that is a very big question. Um, it's, it's kind of Did, a couple but, of but seriously, you said I think you said there are five things that we really ought to know about the, about the metaverse. I mean, I think there's, there's a couple of angles on it to, that, that, that help. I think um, you know, firstly, the, the recognition that the idea of the metaverse has, has been around for a very long time. It was coined in you know, Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, 92. So it's a sort of painful science fiction. But before that, William Gibson had been talking about cyberspace in his uh, cyberpunk novels. And, and, you know, a very similar concept. Now, since then, there have been various waves of trying to invent and roll out the metaverse as in large part as technologies mature, um, you might argue it's already with us. One view of the metaverse is, you know, is if you take Gibson's view of cyberspace, it's already here. That's what the internet is. And then the difference with the metaverse is whether it's in 3D, and some people would argue whether you need to slap a headset on to experience it. So, so one argument isn't that it's coming for us, but it's already come for you and you're in it here in Zoom. Um, and it's perhaps not such a big difference to experience bits of it as a 3D thing. I think there are other people who disagree with that and say very fundamentally it has to be 3D and we all have to be wearing headsets. Um, I'm happy to have that debate, but I'm personally very skeptical about that position. Don't know if that answered the question. It was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> it is. 
I kind I kind of want to know which of the four um, is your favorite. I think I would like the jellyfish, but I'll ask an audience question first, which is. Um, someone says that they're curious about the way that we can trick subjects. Yeah, I'm curious about the way that we can trick subjects. Can you comment on how advanced that research is? It strikes me as similar to optical illusions, but but also a little bit different. Yeah, so, so, so I think there is a lot of, there's clearly a lot of understanding in, in psychology, neuroscience, and various other disciplines about how the senses do and don't integrate. So, you know, there's many many years of research into how vision works with sound um you know lots of research into things like motion sickness for example which in part may be due to some aspects of sensory misalignment although not always not entirely so you know a lot of understanding there and of course visual illusions uh, visual illusions and others are a key part of psychology when you get into digital technologies then you know virtual reality is a playground for this kind of cross-sensory work you know I alluded to some of the work in virtual reality about redirected walking there's also other work that shows experimentally that um, you can fool people by visually making them have to move objects when they lift up a virtual object in a virtual world by having to move them just a bit further than they should and people will then report that as the sensation of weight so you can make people feel that things are heavy so that's another illusion that, that stands up in, in the lab. I think Brendan's kind of work, or, you know, his take on very deliberately misaligning the senses, I think that's relatively new. I mean, we published that a couple of years ago. And, you know, I think at least in, in the kind of virtual reality work, that's, that's less thought about the idea that you can still create an illusion, even if people know, you know, clearly when you're on the swing, you know something weird is going on. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's a newer take on it. And it's interesting because it strikes it strikes me that there's a that there's that there are therapeutic applications as well, right? So I think about the the work that's done on on uh, the use of mirrors to help people struggling with phantom limb syndrome. And so one so um, there's a question in the app about whether redirected walking can help people who are relearning to walk. So does it, could there be a rehabilitative element to that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know whether that's been tried. Uh, intuitively, it feels, yeah, in, in any experience where you can get people to walk, perhaps through virtual worlds in different ways, yeah, sounds really interesting. I don't know. I don't know if it does anything dangerous to your sense of walking there's no evidence that i've seen that it does but you know there is there is clearly some slight mismatch between what you think you're doing and what you are doing physically that you know i'd want to look at in that situation i mean the reason people have done it mostly by the way is just for lack of space in virtual reality installations you know at the moment we can have room size walk around installations not infinite fields and so it's a trick to get around that so yeah, I think that would be great, mm. great to consider the potential and possible drawbacks of, of that for rehab. And it's interesting, right? Like I was listening to your language, dangerous, and there is a moral valence. There is a moral valence to, to the use of these, right? So it's it's an interesting question whether you know if we were if we are you know, the language of tricking people, right? Tricking people for good. What if we're using what if we're using these kinds of I don't know, are they slights of, if they're not slights of hand, are they slights of body, slights of vision, slights of, slights of reality? Um, yeah. Trick yeah. Them, right? To change energy consumption, behaviors of that, of that sort, or rehabilitation or something like that. Does that and, and, and how we deal with those questions and how we see them is, is different in different fields. So, you know, the notion of creating illusions and tricking people is part and parcel of culture and entertainment. It doesn't mean that it's always done ethically or rightly, by the way, uh, you can still get it wrong. But you know, it is accepted when you go, go and watch a film that it's actually kind of not real and you're, you know, what's your play and you're suspending disbelief. What happens when you transfer those practices into other domains where people don't have the same understanding, into healthcare, for example, or policy, then I think you, you do hit a set of issues. And it's certainly a danger with my talk that, you know, sometimes when I talk about uncomfortable interactions, you might read it as a recipe for going out and just doing this stuff everywhere. Um, 
and that's not what I would say. You know, I, I think things, translating things out of the art world into the wider world is a, a, a difficult proposition that, that needs a lot of thinking about. It's really, it's just, it's been absolutely fascinating. Your talk and the conversation after it's, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, and thanks to the audience too, for your participation in this, in this um, Q and A afterwards, because I think it's expanded the scope of our thinking on all of the interactions between technology, art, our perceptions of reality. There is a, you know, I have to say that redirected walking, that experience of changing it a little bit and walking it in a circle of, I've always personally called that London, but that's, <laughs> that might just be me, my experience of it. No, listen, it's been absolutely great to listen Lovely. to you. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Yes. Great to meet Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. So before we move on to um, our next segment for the great debate, I would like to share with you all that we are saving quite an extraordinary performance piece for our final segment. And we do invite you to stay with us after the debate so as not to miss out. I will also tell you that it's quite, it's quite a short piece as well. And um, so it's not like we're inviting you to stay for another hour or something like that. It's just a few minutes and it is really going to be worth your time. Now, I'm very excited to introduce the great debate. And to do this, I would invite Mr. David McCready, OBE, the Chief Executive of the Australian British Chamber of Commerce to adjudicate the great debate. So welcome, Mr. McCready. Thank you very much, Heather, and, and welcome everybody. Well, what a fantastic uh, speech and, and session with Stephen just now. Um, I was fascinated, as you heard, I asked the question, can I put this on my kids on the swing set on this, uh, you know, on this coming weekend? I'm, I'm keen to see what, what happens. I was very interested to note that SICK was on almost all of the word clouds that he presented on screen as well, in quite large letters, I might add. But uh, look, it's been a fantastic um, set of sessions so far today. And uh, it's my great pleasure over about the next hour to moderate the great debate. And uh, as you'll remember from your high school or university debating days, we've got an affirmative and negative team of three each who will take on this uh, important challenge, I think. Uh, the, the proposition, the hypothesis tonight is this house believes that digi digitization is reshaping humanity for the better. I'm interested to see who on this can really drive a strong argument for the negative. That's my personal opinion, but there'll be some great arguments on both sides, I'm sure. And I really look forward to hearing from each of the speakers uh, during the course of the evening. And I really encourage you to uh, take part. Uh, there is an app, there will be a, a on-screen now, hopefully is a QR code, uh, grab your phone, get ready to, to snap it if you haven't already so that you can vote uh, and I'll be announcing the winner at the end of the evening, but we'll have three speakers from each size. I'll, I'll tell you about who's gonna come in what order in a moment. Uh, following that, we'll have Joe Holland, who's my colleague. I run the Australian British Chamber of Commerce based here in Australia. My colleague, Joe Holland, who runs the Australia UK Chamber based over there in London, uh, will give some thoughts at the end of the, uh, of the presentations uh, from both sides. And then we'll announce the winner, and then I'll pass back to Heather at the end of at the end of the evening uh, before that magnificent performance that she spoke about uh, just a moment ago. So um, I'm not sure if the QR code has been up on screen yet for for people. Um, if not, I'm sure we can put it into the chat, and we'll find a way to make sure that you can vote. Um, so we have six very distinguished speakers. And given that I may have letters after my name, but no professor or associate professor uh, before my name, I feel very, very humbled to be in such uh, august company this evening. Um, for the affirmative, we'll have Dr. Sky Doherty, uh, who is a lecturer at the School of Communication and Arts at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and Global Change Scholars Program Coordinator the Graduate School at UQ. Uh, I think you've probably got the award for the longest title uh, today, but um, fantastic to have you along. Associate Professor Elizabeth, oh sorry, 
The second affirmative speaker will be Dr. Richard Seo, uh, Director of Aging Research at King's College London. Terrific to have you, welcome and good morning. And the third speaker for the affirmative will be Associate Professor Claire Sullivan, who is the Associate Professor Conjoint uh, at the Centre for Health Services Research, the Faculty of Medicine at UQ. And welcome along to you, Claire. Terrific to see you again. I know many of us saw you earlier on uh, today, so thank you very much for being part of the session today. On the negative side, we'll have Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens, who is uh, Australian Research Council Future Fellow. That sounds incredibly difficult to be on the negative side, but I'm, I'll, we'll leave that there at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities at the University of Queensland. Uh, the second speaker for the negative will be uh, Professor Toby Walsh, a Laureate Fellow and Scientia Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of New South Wales. Toby, welcome to you. And our third speaker for the negative, and we'll have the last word, is Professor Catherine Gelber, Head of School at the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ. So that, ladies and gentlemen, will be the lineup. We'll go affirmative, negative, as you remember. Uh, they will have five minutes each. Um, I will be giving them some little hand signals in the background to uh, make them aware when they're at three minutes and then at five minutes, we're going to cut them off. It's not me. It's the production team. They're going to do a great job, I'm sure. And then you'll find me fumbling to catch the ball and keep running with it as we introduce the next speaker. But I know there's lots to get through and the last person you need to hear from is me. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sky Doherty to open the case for the affirmative. Dr. Sky. Thank you for the introduction. Adjudicator, opponents, guests. Digital technologies augment and enhance human ingenuity. They are the means by which we share information, care for the weak, feed our growing populations, and reduce our impact on the world. Digitization is the foundation of computation. It's the process of converting physical information into bits and bytes. The tools we developed to interact with digital information make it possible for us to store vast amounts of data, to analyze it, to make complex calculations, and to communicate across time and space. This is the stuff of magic and science fiction, and it's shaping the way we interact with each other and our world, overwhelmingly for the better. Thanks to social and mobile technologies, we can speak, see, and write to several people all at once, in real time, across vast distances. We're doing this right now. Thanks to machine learning, we can train algorithms to help health workers diagnose diseases more accurately and efficiently. And thanks to virtual reality, we can experience what it's like to live with color blindness or be in a war zone. And this means we can empathize more deeply and understand the lives of others. There are thousands of examples like this of how digital technologies are augmenting work, enhancing our creativity and reshaping humanity for the better. But let me offer two cases that illustrate quite clearly the benefits of digital technologies in our everyday life, sharing knowledge and guaranteeing our food systems. It would be folly to diminish the positive impact digital technologies have had on learning and knowledge sharing. The past two years are testament to the value of the computer hardware, social software and digital archives that have allowed us practically overnight to move our classrooms, our workplaces and our research institutes into cyberspace. Despite a global pandemic, we've continued to educate children, deliver goods and services, create cultural artifacts and share ideas. And this is not a stopgap measure. The OECD has says digital technologies have allowed us to find new answers about what, how and where people learn and has elevated the role of teachers from imparting knowledge to co-creating it. The ability to learn, share, create is fundamental to humanity. Digital technologies enhance that capability. Yet more fundamental though, is our ability to feed ourselves. Droughts and floods are changing the land and challenging our farming methods. In Australia, the millennium drought devastated parts of our 
food system to the point where productivity at some, in some places is not back to where it was beforehand. Once we would have increased production simply by using more land and water, but this is no longer an option. In Australia today, farmers use digital technologies to know when fruit trees have had enough water, when a cow is injured and when a paddock needs fertilizer. This information means they can make better decisions about how to use the land and improve yields. There's estimates that these kinds of techniques can boost agricultural production by 25%. In a world where the population is expected to grow significantly, natural resources are becoming scarce, scarcer and climate changing dramatically, we need to produce much more with less and digital technologies make that possible. Our opponents will likely attempt to convince you that digitization undermines our humanity because it facilitates surveillance, embeds bias in algorithms, amplifies misinformation and consolidates technological might and therefore political and economic power in a handful of companies. They're right. But it's not digitization that is the cause of this. It's us, humans. We've created amazing digital tools, that have, but we have failed to develop the systems, the regulations and laws that ensure these tools serve the public interest. We have chosen to commercialize the internet. This is on us, but we can make different choices. Digital technologies can be designed to enhance democracy, improve equality and address environmental challenges. We can create technologies that are accessible, ethical, repairable, sustainable and biodegradable. We just need to choose to do so. Thank you. Well, well said, Sky. I think there's some great content there to, to lead off the conversation this evening. So thank you very much for your contribution. I won't try and you know, guide people along the journey. So I'll try and be as impartial as I can as we move forward. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Sky, for opening the debate this evening. It's now my great pleasure to welcome the first speaker for the negative, Associate, Associate Professor Elizabeth Stevens, to, uh, to open her side's rebuttal and, uh, and to put their caps. Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sky Doherty, for her opening um, gambit as well in this great debate. So in many ways, taking a negative position in relation to digitization at this point in the 21st century, as I am doing today, feels a little bit like arguing against electricity or the steam engine in the 19th. Digitization is both a fact of contemporary life and it's the great engine of contemporary culture. And the first affirmative speaker outlined very well some of the positives of this. But in my brief response, I will argue that just as the first great wave of industrialization in the 19th century brought about much social, economic and environmental devastation, so are many of the transformations caused by digitization in the present day emphatically not shaping humanity for the better. In this respect, I take a different approach from that of the first affirmative speaker who saw something magical in the digital and its inexorable extension across everyday life. But if digitization is shaping humanity for the better, I ask you, why do I, a human, feel so much worse when I spend large amounts of time or online or in digital space? Over the past two years, the pandemic has provided us with ample opportunity to discover what a sudden exponential growth of digitization looks like. We have found ourselves in the midst of a vast social experiment in which we have had to learn how to work, socialize, exercise, attend weddings and funerals, manage all the aspects of our life online. Where the previous speaker identified benefits in such things as the rise of computational systems, I contend that the forces of digitization and the best interest of humanity are not always convergent, but on the contrary, often deeply opposed. We see this in two key ways, which I would briefly discuss here. 
The first is that living online is clearly toxic for human bodies and brains. And we know this because when virtual life gets too much for us, we say we need a digital detox. But you don't need to detox from something that is shaping your life for the better. Sometimes it feels like we're going to be trapped inside these little Zoom boxes forever, trying to avoid the disconcerting sight of our own faces on the screen in front of us. Online life is filled with cognitive contortions like this. So if digitization is shaping humanity for the better, why does living online make me feel so sad, as though the camera is stealing little pieces of my soul every time I log on? Virtual catch-ups with friends and family, but no possibilities of hugs can leave us feeling empty afterwards. Why does walking on a beach or in a park after too much screen time feel like such an antidote to online life? Don't we only need antidotes for things that are poisonous? The second reason that digitization is not shaping humanity for the better, which my colleagues on the negative team will explore and expand on in more detail, is that the best interests of digitization and those of humanity are in fact often actively opposed. We saw this during the great age of mechanization in the 19th century, and we're seeing it again now at the dawn of the age of digitization. Left to their own devices, these systems will prioritize their own proliferation and optimization at the expense of all else. The 18 hour workdays on factory assembly lines that fueled the industrial revolution are back. They're back in the digital factories of the 21st century. They're back in the platform economies. They're back in surveillance capitalism. And they're back in the offices and emails that come home with us to be answered at night on our mobile phones. The social, physical, environmental, and economic consequences of this are enormous. But none of them, I put it to you, could be said to be shaping humanity for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And, and uh, uh, when you uh, drew back to the previous centuries, I was also thinking of King Canute trying to hold back the tide, a very good, solid British story for, for an Australia-UK uh, uh, environment. But uh, thank you very much for, for, for putting your case. I have to say to the speakers, I'm feeling confl completely conflicted and I have no idea which way to turn next. So I'm going to uh, move on straight away to our second speaker for the affirmative, Dr. Richard Siao. Pleasure to have you with us this morning, your time in the UK, and, and welcome to all of ours, our friends who are joining us from the other side of the world. Um, and uh, we look forward to your presentation and hearing how you will take this case forward for the affirmative. Richard, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Judicator, esteemed colleagues and audience. Uh, I put it to you that digitization is in all of our lives and we are benefiting from it. We know it. The um, negative team has highlighted the toxic culture of the online virtual world. And uh, this is something new. However, we need to see that digitization has been part of human culture from the beginning of time and in prehistory. We have needed to digitize. Even the cavemen before, they were making evaluations, risk evaluations. Were they surviving? Were they extending both their lifespan or also their health span? Um, the pressures of finding food, the pressures of escaping uh, things that would eat them. This has all involved digital decision-making. However, coming to our current situation, uh, we've been through two years of heavy reliance on the benefits of our digital uh, metaverse, you could say. This new digital frontier, which I'm putting to you is not so new. Um, what we need to see is that we haven't been trapped in a virtual Zoom world. We are benefiting this morning uh, or this evening from 
connectivity between Australia and the UK. So many of us uh, across vast distances have been able to connect due to the, through the benefits of having digital technologies. I think in Australia, you understand that a lot better. Uh, previously, you relied on flying doctors. Now we have digital virtual doctors who can be on call 24 seven. Um, the negative team referred to a, a toxic culture of digitization where we need to detoxify. But I put it to you also that this has kept our mental and also physical health um, at a stage that we have benefited. We have been tracking the number of steps that we haven't taken <laughs> over the past two years. And we've been alerted to that fact from digital technologies. Uh, we've been able to contact loved ones through digital technologies in the presence of the pandemic. And also we have benefited. I think humanity has actually progressed because we've been much more aware of the pressures and the needs across the globe. Without digital tools, um, you could say 24 seven, it has it wouldn't have been uh, possible for us to be aware of the spread of the pandemic, making use of novel technologies, uh, especially in the third world. They have learned a lot. We have been able to provide digital tools, digital technologies to the third world as well. And you could argue, coming back to history, even the printing press was a digital tool that we all benefited from. How we could transfer knowledge in a sustainable and also much more efficient way. So the arguments I would like to make uh, this morning are really from history through to today and also the future. We are entering a new digital frontier and there has indeed been exponential growth in the awareness of technologies. We have learned a lot, it's education. We are all educators and we are all in the learning journey together. And it's the digital tools that have enabled us to, as, as the man on the street, to learn about um, what mRNA vaccines are. This, this is a term that would have been uh, unheard of, but because of the necessity of turning to digital tools to learn, to be better informed, so that we can take positive steps for our own health and wellness. Uh, it's not that we've been fighting disease, but we've only been able to access health and wellness, for example, through our supermarkets. And it's through the supermarkets that we've even been able to track what we are buying, what we are eating, and how we have been growing more healthily. So with that, I put it to you that digitization is beneficial for humanity, and we should embrace it, as we have all benefited in every aspect of our lives. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Richard, and, and thank you for progressing very solidly, I think, the, uh, the case for the affirmative. Uh, and to uh, rebut and bring forward some of the themes uh, drawn out by, um, uh, by the first speaker, Elizabeth Stevens, Toby Walsh, I am delighted to invite you to speak uh, as the second speaker for the negative. Thank you. Our, our honourable opponents have argued that digitisation has happened throughout history. I should, however, remind you that collecting taxes was when we first started to digitalize our lives. Uh, our opponents have also argued that digitalization has made us more productive. That's indeed very true. But those gains have not been shared. The millionaires and billionaires have got richer and the rest of us have been left behind. Adjusted for inflation, median wages have not increased since I was a young boy in the UK growing up in the 1970s. That's not the growing pains of a new technology. That's 50 years of digital reality. I, I want to put forward, though, two of my own arguments why digitization is not reshaping humanity for the better. My first argument is the problem that turning people into zeros and ones uh, is that zeros and ones can easily be hacked. And the uncomfortable truth is the human brain is very easily hacked. We'd like to think that we're perfectly rational decision makers, but the reality is far from this. 
Um, behavioral psychology is a catalog of ways in which the human brain makes irrational decisions. We buy products we don't need. We vote for people who don't advance our interests. Um, and in digitization is putting the way we hack human brains on steroids. Um, unfortunately, evolution hasn't equipped our pleasure-seeking brains to resist the persuasive and personalized digital marketing. Um, digital tools mean that we can now micro-target individuals. The internet you see is unique to you. It's tailored to your particular interests, your particular politics and your particular pleasures. Um, you see a completely different internet to the one that I see. Um, and in the past, if an advertiser told untruths, we'd all see them for what they are. That's no longer the case. So that's my first argument. Digital tools are perfect for hacking our brains. And my second argument is connected. It's that digitization is collecting lots of data with which to do that hacking. We're all spending more and more time online with our smartphones and other devices that are tracking us constantly. That tracking data, of course, is immensely valuable for, how to, for deciding how to hack our brains. Everything we do, everything we read, everything we watch, it's known to digital advertisers who use that information to target our weaknesses. That's why digital data has been called the new oil. It's lubricating surveillance capitalism. We've already seen great harms committed by being able to hack how people think. Would Trump have been elected without the misuse of social media to discourage black people and other minorities from coming out to vote? And would genocide have taken place in Myanmar without Facebook to incite violence? Studies suggest that people who log off social media get happier. Young people, especially young girls, are facing a crisis around body image, eating disorders, and self-esteem brought about by social media. And social media is polarizing our political discourse, dividing, not uniting us through echo chambers and fake news. Authors like George Orwell has warned us of this future. But Orwell got one thing wrong. It's not Big Brother. It's not people watching people. We saw the limits of that in East Germany. No, it's computers watching people. We can do that on a national scale, at speed, scale, and cost that humans cannot match. And digitalization is bringing that world of 1984 into existence today. You only have to look at how the Chinese authorities are using digital tools to surveil and suppress the Uyghurs. That's a fate that awaits us all if we're not careful. The last two years have been a difficult and challenging time as we've tackled the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we've learned one important truth during this time. The thing that we've missed most are things like nature, our social contacts, the physical presence of other people. These are the things that give us true satisfaction and meaning, not artificial zeros and ones in some digital metaverse. No thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. Give me real people, not legless avatars. As Elizabeth was arguing, we want the feeling of sun on our face, the wind in our hair, to hug again our friends and families, to share food and laughter. Concrete, real experiences, not abstract digital ones. Thank you. Well, a very compelling case that you laid before us, Toby, I have to say. Uh, I almost felt like I was getting shivers down the back of my spine at the end there when I remembered the feeling of a warm hug. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a mile, well, a million miles away from my, my family this evening. I'm actually coming to you from Adelaide. Um, so uh, I, know, I know that feeling of a, a nice hug certainly is, uh, is welcomed by all. Um, but that's not to say that there's not good things about the digital world. And I'm pleased to hand over to Associate Professor Claire Sullivan to, uh, to wrap together the affirmative case and really put the nails in the coffin of the, defense, of the negative. Claire, over to you. Take it forward. You need to unmute yourself, sorry, Claire. Uh, Mr. Adjudicator and dear colleagues, it is clear that digital technologies are shaping society for the better. Please note that I'm not proposing that they're perfect. Many of the criticisms of digital technology leveraged by my esteemed colleagues are indeed true. We would all rather the sun on our faces than the wind on our back. However, without digital technologies, we would not be able to connect, continue to educate, search Medline, create new knowledge, and share that knowledge at scale. 
So this side of the house accepts the criticisms posed by our colleagues on the negative side. However, on the balance, we could propose that digital technologies are shaping humanity for the better, not the perfect. Our first, uh, I guess, point is that it is important to remember that uh, digital technologies affect different people in different ways. Our first speaker on the opposition highlighted that she was receiving Zoom fatigue and was feeling a little bit worn out after her day using Zoom technology, which I agree with. However, digital technologies such as Zoom are saving lives. I work as a doctor in Australia's largest tertiary hospital. And during the pandemic, we have used Zoom in maternity wards to deliver babies stuck. We have used Zoom to guide surgeons isolated in rural Queensland to complete complicated operations. We have used Zoom to deliver chemotherapy to people who are isolated and away from their families. We have used Zoom to actually guide inexperienced junior doctors in rural emergency departments to secure an airway. I agree that we get Zoom fatigued, but on the balance, it's very clear to see that digitization is saving lives. And to me, that's worth some Zoom fatigue. Our other uh, opponent, I think quite rightly, is exhibiting some fear around the unintended consequences of digitization. And I share those same fears. We're not proposing that digitization is perfect, but on the balance, the lives saved and the knowledge shared outweighs those fears that we have with any new technology. Listening to him speak, I'm reminded of a lecture that I had during my training about the worries that doctor, doctors had during the introduction of the thermometer. They were told that the thermometer would de-skill nurses, would take away the roles of doctors, would create a surveillance of the patients that had never been seen before. And this is in 17th century Edinburgh. It's interesting that we are talking exactly the same way in 2021. So I think it is absolutely right that we should have our concerns and there will be unintended consequences. However, the balance is that digitization is shaping our society for the better. I'll now go over our arguments from our side. Our first speaker really talked about the ability to learn and share knowledge as a fundamental way to shape society for the better. She agreed that there are quite unintended negative consequences of digital technology which we must manage. But it is important to remember that perfection is the enemy of done. Whenever you introduce new technology, such as a new surgery, new chemotherapy, there will be side effects. That doesn't mean you don't get chemotherapy. It means that we manage those side effects. We can't be absolutist about any new treatment, whether it's digital technology, surgery, or chemotherapy. All have side effects, all have negative um, consequences. It doesn't mean we don't do them. I'm not sure where this absolutism around technology has come from, but when the benefits are framed against the side effects in the same way as chemotherapy or surgery, I think it becomes clearer that digitization is shaping our society for the better. Our second speaker talked through the accessibility and the way that digital technology has kept us online, connected and communicating during the pandemic. It's been able to minimize some of the inequities through transmitting technologies and care across vast distances. So I will now sum up our argument. It is increasingly a complex world in which we live. It is sometimes impossible to communicate and understand the complexity of things around us. When considering digital health, I think of the good, the bad and the ugly. In our summary, I would like to say that it is important that you accept fear as a part of life, specifically the fear of change. I have gone ahead with change to, to despite the pounding in my heart that says turn back by Erica de Jong. And I think that's because there is good in digitization. It will shape our society. There are negative consequences, which we as sophisticated individuals can manage. And so I am pleased to propose that digitization is shaping our society for the better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Um, I, I was reminded in your closing comments there when you said you went forward despite being afraid of every time I've got on a roller coaster in my life, 
that's probably a fresh memory from Doctor <laughs> from from the presentation earlier this evening. But uh, uh, certainly, uh, certainly something really resonant about everything that you've put forward there. So I really look forward to hearing uh, Catherine Gelber, um, Professor Catherine Gelber, the head of school at the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ, for the last word in the debate. Uh, good luck. Your time starts now. Thank you very much, Mr. Adjudicator, colleagues, and the audience. So our the affirmative team has recognised many of our arguments. Thank you. We're very grateful for that. But they also made a few that I can't help but go past. The first speaker for the affirmative said that VR has the capacity to make people empathise more deeply. With respect, there's really not a lot of evidence that that's what digitisation is doing, as I will show. She also said that we could just choose to design our way out of the problems that we face ourselves with. And respectfully, again, I beg to differ, and I will again outline why. The second speaker for the affirmative talked a lot about connectivity, saying that it's easier for people to connect. And as I and our team's other members have pointed out, some people are forming communities, but this is at great cost to others, other individuals, other communities, and the well-being of many people who are using the online sphere. The first speaker for the affirmative also said information sharing is easier. Yes, that can be true. But again, as I will clarify, at what cost? The costs of the forms of information sharing that are prioritised in the digitisation era are being unfairly and disproportionately dealt out. It is overwhelmingly the vulnerable and the marginalised who experience the costs that others benefit from with digitisation. We recognise, for example, the very good medical uses that the third speaker of the affirmative spoke about. But she said that on balance, that makes, the, the digi that makes digitization good for humanity. Again, with respect, on balance, I don't think that that conclusion can be drawn. The, the issues that we've talked about in our team are not fears, they're facts. Surveillance is a fact. Data collection, sometimes illegal data collection by very significant major governments on millions or billions of people is a fact. The use of that data to manipulate us is a fact. Those things are not fierce. I'm going to move now to outline two further substantive arguments for the negative case that I hope will finish the argument off. The first is that digitisation means that we have no choice but to, but to participate in an online environment that facilitates, enables and exacerbates harms, especially on the most vulnerable. And the second is that we cannot somehow create a regulatory environment to solve these problems. Instead, we need to recognise that these problems are inherent to the nature of the medium itself. So to my first point, digitisation means we have no choice but to participate in an online environment that facilitates, enables and exacerbates harms, especially on the most vulnerable. Digitisation is unavoidable. In January this year, there were 4.95 billion active internet users worldwide, equivalent to 62.5% of the global population, and this grows by 10% per year. Many of our daily activities require us to be online. Just think of the QR codes and check-ins that have been mandatory during the pandemic. We use the online world for our medical records, interaction with government departments, banking, bill paying, enrolling to vote, everything. But this is also a harmful environment. There's no doubt that digitisation facilitates, enables and magnifies speech-based harms because it enables rapid and very widespread dissemination of speech into people's personal devices targeted at their personal feeds through algorithms. More people come into contact with speech-based harms and those disposed to engage in it do so from the anonymity of a keyboard and at lightning speed. I don't only mean that people get nasty things said to them, although there's plenty of that, with politicians like Julia Banks and Nicole Flint being targeted with vile slurs and threats and having to resign from public life. We also have speech that discriminates against people, like anti-Semitism, racism, anti-Muslim hatred, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia and gendered vilification. A 2020 e-safety report on online hate speech 
reported that 15% of the population in Australia and New Zealand had been directly exposed to online hate speech in only the previous 12 months. In late 2019, 18 United Nations Special Rapporteurs, five independent experts and three working groups released a statement expressing concerns about the global increase in online hate speech and incitement to discrimination. And of course, those types of speech also paved the way for other types of harm, such as radicalisation, violent extremism and terrorism. The Christchurch attack in 2019 was a perfect example. A single gunman radicalised online, live streamed an attack that left on two mosques that left 51 people dead and 40 injured. And that doesn't count for indirect harms. Research shows that algorithms are not objective. They're written by humans and they have human bias embedded in their DNA. They actively re reproduce and reinforce marginalization. And now to my second point, that good regulation won't fix it. There are countless attempts globally to regulate our way out of this problem. In May 2016, the European Commission and four major online platforms announced a new code of conduct. In February 2019, the UK government announced it would fine social media companies that did not remove harmful content. Germany imposes fines of up to 50 million euros on social media companies that don't delete hate speech. And in Australia, we have a new Online Safety Act and, act and furious legislative activity. Social media companies are being required to act, take action. But the problem continues to grow. The first speaker for the affirmative said we could design our way out of these problems, but we can't. Why? Because the problem lies with digitization itself. As psychologist Mary Aiken reports, digitization is changing human behavior already. It changes how we perceive the world, how our brains develop, how we behave towards others, how we transmit social norms and values among the community, and of course, safety. These are not side effects, they are intrinsic. We're losing a sense of the collective, we're vulnerable. This is harming individuals, communities, and even democracy. Sure, the opposition will tell you there are good aspects to digitization. This doesn't override the fact that taken as a whole, this medium is toxic, it's bad for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kath. Um, look, I, I, I have been swayed by both sides repeatedly. I am but a leaf in the breeze, I think, this evening. But the great news is, whilst everybody has very kindly called me the adjudicator, the decision is in your hands, ladies and gentlemen, not in mine. I will but report the results of the, uh, of the poll. Uh, there will be, hopefully on your screen at the moment, the great debate voting. There will be a QR code. I know that that got mentioned in the debate. I won't go into whether we're tracking you or not. I don't think we are. We're just trying to get your vote for the purposes of this evening. Could you please um, avail yourselves of the technology at hand and, uh, and, uh, and vote? I think even the negative side uh, may not think it's for the better broadly, but for the purposes of this vote, they would certainly like it. Have your vote. So please, uh, please avail yourselves of the uh, of the opportunity. Um, we're we're going to give you three minutes to vote, and uh, I'm going to, in a moment, introduce my great friend and colleague Joe Holland uh, to to give a bit of a summary and some thoughts on what's happened. Um, I would like to say it was really interesting. We did a poll, and a number of people answered this before we started this evening, and it was very interesting. This is not to sway your vote as you make it now. Please make it un unencumbered with this information. But there are 20% for the affirmative proposition. There were 35% for the negative proposition and 45% who are unsure. Now, we need no unsures when we get to the uh, the back end of this. There's a, a lovely pie, pie chart on screen. Jeez, I'm no good at technology. I couldn't do that that quickly. Well done to the team behind <laughs> Uh, behind the, the, the behind the scenes tonight for making that appear so quickly. Um, but uh, so grab your phone, make sure you've got that QR code. Uh, you're in the voting process and you get your votes in. There's probably a minute and a half or so to go, but I'm going to pass over to Joe Holland, my great friend and colleague for a few minutes. So you have plenty of time to get those in. Great debate, the, that QR code's there now. Make sure you're availing yourself of that. But Joe, it is wonderful to be uh, partnering 
uh, and handing over to you as such a great friend of mine and of the chambers uh, here in Australia, the chamber in the UK. Great to have you with us, Joe. Over to you. And thank you, David. Um, and good morning from the UK and good evening in Australia. From the UK Australian Chamber of Commerce here in London, I'm delighted to be giving you some reflections on this fabulous event, which has explored and celebrated the relationship between Australia and the UK across the arts, creative industries and higher education. Firstly, I'd like to thank and acknowledge the important role Professor Heather Zwicker has played as MC throughout both part A and part B of this event. And thank you to the panelists and presenters in part A, David McCready, my good friend, OBE um, on, on part B, and um, he's soon to be announcing the winning team and his role as adjudicator. Keynote speaker, Professor Stephen Benford, the debaters hard work with preparation and presentations and the UQ Debating Society for coaching the teams. Now, reflecting on the debate, there were some very strong arguments for and against. Digitization enhances our lives, health, learning, food production, interactions with others, and enhances our experiences, both good and bad, to improve understanding on a variety of situations. And the debate outlined many other positive aspects. However, digitization can have a negative impact when it impacts the way we feel and takes away our choices. So in the future, more emphasis will need to be given to balancing these pros and cons, and there'll be many more debates <clears throat> on balancing the effects. Now, on the wider topic of this event, which has been brought to the audience by the partnership between UQ and the UK Government and Science Innovation Network, the partnerships between Australia and the UK have never been more important. This first free trade agreement for the UK and the 17th for Australia has been agreed and signed in record time. And the speed of this agreement demonstrates the desire of both countries to forge ahead and create a partnership that will greatly benefit them both. Academic institutions have an important role to play and especially UQ, which has a long history and demonstrable track record in research and innovation. And this combined with their global engagement will create a deeper connection between the UK and Australian industries. Finally, thank you to the audience for your participation. I'm now welcoming back my good friend, David McCready for his final comments and to announce the winning team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and what a great summary, I mean, there's so many great points that I remember too from the debate this evening. And, and uh, I, I, I wonder whether, I, going back to the comment I made earlier about King Canute, can we actually hold back this tide, that the digitization of everything? Um, whether, you, you, whether you're for the affirmative or the negative, I, I worry that there is no holding it back. The tide will rise and, uh, and we will have to see where it takes. Um, that's probably to the next debate, which might be, well be about climate change, but that's another story altogether. Let's bring it back to the debate this evening. It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful exposition of, of how people can think through a variety of different sides. And uh, I'm pleased to be able to announce that we have a clear winner. Well, when you think about it, um, Clear winners are interesting when you talk about percentages, but we won't go to Brexit. That's another conversation again. Um, look, tonight, the winner, uh, with in popular acclaim and by a margin that it means that I am able to say they are a clear winner this evening, is the negative team. Congratulations. With 53% of the vote, uh, giving roundings 46% to the affirmative. Um, Personally, I have to say, my impression coming into tonight was that, of course, digitization is better. I can't do anything without having a mobile phone in my hand. So it must be great and supportive. But I have uh, personally also been very much swayed by the negatives view. Although I have to say, Claire Sullivan's point that actually, if you say on balance that it's only better, 
I have to say that did give me a little bit of a, a tweak towards the affirmative. So where did I wind up? Well, I didn't vote because it was just far too hard to split the teams tonight. Could I thank again all our speakers? Could I thank the UQ Debating Club who have uh, spent some time coaching our, uh, if they needed coaching, but giving them reminders of the formalities of debating um, and, and bringing uh, this all together tonight. Could I thank UQ and uh, everybody who's been associated with this from the British government as well, uh, Her Excellency Vicky, Vicky Trudell, who spoke earlier, uh, but also to the SIN team and, and Lara, but also the British Council. It's been a, a broad church that has brought this event together tonight and I've been pleased to be a very small part of it. Uh, and I'm very pleased that I wasn't having to decide as you could tell from my comments just now. Um, could I also very much acknowledge and thank again Jo uh, Holland for her um, comments and wrap up. Uh, again, it, it made me think on both sides of the argument and, and I very much appreciate uh, your support tonight, Jo, as well. We look forward to doing much more with you in partnership as we already do going forward. Um, it's now my great pleasure to hand back to our wonderful MC, as Jo said, through both sessions today and all the work of all the UQ team, uh, from those on the outside of UQ, it's been an enormous effort and thank you very much for all your support. But Heather, if I can pass back to you to wrap up the evening and to send us into the evening here in Australia and into our day in the UK with another great performance. But to, to you first, Heather. Uh, listen, thank you very much, David. And thank you to everybody who participated in that debate. Listen, here's the side that I think won. I think the side that won is the side that argued for Uber being able to use a sustainably produced digital device to order Uber Eats, which was paying drivers an equitable fair wage with adequate health cover to come and deliver sustainably produced food grown by using digitally enhanced technology that then I would then be able to, you know, pay for conveniently through those digital means and then consume with friends and family around me. I'm just saying, I would like to have it all. And friends and family, universally lovely people who would never be radicalized or be committing hate crimes online. I'm just saying that's, that's kind of the team, that was the winning position that I was hearing emerge from this debate. Really proud of all of the work that you have done and really, really pleased with how the entire day has come together. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everybody who participated specifically in the debate and over the entirety of the day. I'd like to thank the University of Queensland and the UK government for hosting the event. I'd like to thank the Australian British Chamber of Commerce and the Australia United Kingdom Chamber of Commerce for your support. And uh, a big thanks to all of the people who have worked behind the scenes for months to make this event a big success. Finally, a big thank you to all of our presenters and to you, the audience, for making today so enriching and engaging at the level of conversation, provocation, thought, and implication, because these conversations don't end today. We carry them with us into our evening here in Australia, into our day in Europe, in the United Kingdom, and in London. Just so you know what happens next, the teams will be working hard to get both part A and part B up on YouTube in the coming days. Uh, everyone who registered will get an email when this is uploaded, along with an event survey. We, we want to know how our work went over, so I do encourage you to provide meaning, meaningful feedback so that we can keep producing meaningful, topical, and stimulating events like this in the future. To bring today's program to an end, we have a very special performance. This work was created by Associate Professor Eve Klein, who's a senior lecturer in popular music and technology at the University of Queensland. Uh, Associate Professor Klein collaborates with festivals, scientists, artists, and researchers to develop cross-disciplinary performance experiences. Her work, Vocal Womb, is an example of this practice, and it's the first of its kind to deploy laryngoscopy, 
during real-time performances for a live audience. Vocal Womb allows its audience to explore the relationship between voice, identity, and power by stepping into and directly manipulating the voice of another. So I should probably give you a little bit of a content warning if you're squeamish about images, medical images and that kind of thing, just know that you might, that you will see some in this performance, but also you should know that if you are moved by beautiful opera singing, you're getting that as well. It's a really provocative piece and a bit full on. That performance, which is just about um, five minutes long, will bring the event to a close. So we'll run it and we'll let you exit when it is over. Thank you for joining us. And I really do hope that you enjoy Eve's work. I've certainly enjoyed my day with you. Good day to you over the across the pond. Good evening to you here in Australia. Hi everyone. I'm Associate Professor Eve Klein. I'm a music technologist and artistic researcher in the School of Music at the University of Queensland. I make large scale public artworks experienced by hundreds of thousands of people around the world, mainly at festivals. I craft artworks by shaping sound and music with interactive technologies in playful ways. My process combines community engagement with interactive world building, and I utilize sound to create deep connections to places and people via this act of listening. Technological innovation lies at the core of each artwork because I'm curious about pushing the boundaries of audience experience and immersion. But importantly, each artwork is crafted collaboratively with researchers, community groups, festivals, cultural organizations, and other NGOs. And we work together to better invite audiences to discuss solutions to real world challenges. Art has great capacity to break down the barriers between us and engender empathy across difference. My artistic practice enables me to locate problems in the real world by talking with and working with communities and my research practice enables me to investigate these problems and find radical new ways of opening up discussion with the broader public and it's so that we can re really reach change by navigating difficult conversations together in safe ways. Some of the artworks that have had these difficult conversations at the heart of them have explored topics like gendered and racial violence, climate change, refugee rights, and the impact of colonialism. Today, I'm going to share with you a taste of one of my more challenging works called Vocal Womb. This performance and installation work externalizes the hidden, fleshy and deeply personal workings of the voice from inside a singer's body, from inside my body, in fact. Picture this, participants sit across from an opera singer. She wears a laryngoscope, a thin viewing tube which passes through her nose and provides real-time video of her vocal cords projected into the performance space. Audio is captured from inside her body by contact mics placed on her skin and you can hear the sound of her lungs inhaling and exhaling and her other internal organs gurgling with their everyday functions. Participants remix these signals and amplify them into the performance space. And in doing so, by externalizing what's so intimate and internal in this exaggerated and overwhelming sonic and visual experience, participants are asked to confront the contradiction of our voices, of how we culturally negotiate and wield this idea of voice to create a sense of our shared humanity. I hope you enjoy this taste of vocal womb.
Contraction. 